All righty. Good morning. I'm Councilmember Donovan Richards from the 31st District in Queens, and I'm the chair of the Public Safety Committee. This is our second hearing this month, and unfortunately, just as we did earlier this month, we have to begin on a somber note as another NYPD officer took uh, his life this morning on Long Island. This is the fourth member of the NYPD to take their own life this month and the sixth this year. This is a crisis that we have a responsibility to figure out how to appropriately address. We may never know what these officers were going through, but I'm committed to working with Commissioner O'Neill to figure out how we can create better support services for our officers that provide them the freedom to come forward to speak to professionals without fear of losing a paycheck or their job. We have to get a handle on this as soon as possible, and I look forward to having more discussions with the NYPD on how the Council can help to expand the resources available to officers and eradicating the stigma that comes along with law enforcement officers speaking about their mental health. Let's have a moment of silence. Thank you. Today we are taking up several pieces of legislation. I'll start with the two bills related to untraceable firearms that are also that I'm also co-sponsoring. Introduction number 1553, sponsored by Councilmember Rosenthal, in relation to prohibiting unfinished frames or receivers, which are items that can be purchased on the internet and easily converted into untraceable firearms. Introduction 1548, sponsored by my Southeast Queens colleague who will be here, Councilmember Miller, in relation to reporting on the seizure of three-dimensional printed guns and ghost guns, or any piece or part thereof. In resolution number 866, also sponsored by Councilmember Miller, calling on the United States Congress to pass and the President to sign H.R. 7115, also referred to as the 3D Firearms Prohibition Act. We are also hearing a bill sponsored by Councilmember Drum that seeks to uphold the presumption of innocence that is fundamental to our nation's justice system, but isn't always honored in the court of public opinion. The bill is introduction number 635 in relation to prohibiting staged perp walks. Next, we are hearing a bill sponsored by Councilmember Trago, who unfortunately can't be present today. Introduction number 567 in relation to internet purchase, purchase exchange locations, which would create safe spaces for people to conduct transactions initiated online with strangers. Now I'll turn to one of the bills I'm co-sponsoring along with my, my colleague, Councilmember Borelli. Introduction number 1244 in relation to prohibiting certain unsolicited disclosures of intimate images. This bill would make it a crime to send a stranger unwanted lewd photographs using electronic devices and software such as Apple's iDrop. Now, I'm all for advances in technology, but the last thing we need is another way for people to engage in sexual harassment. Anyone who's been to one of my hearings knows I oppose the expansion of the criminal justice system, but there really is no justification for this kind of conduct. It's not a crime of poverty. This is just about basic decency and protecting potential victims of sexual harassment. Last but certainly not least, I want to turn to a very important bill that I'm sponsoring, which follows up on a hearing we did last year addressing the NYPD's gang database. Pre-considered introduction to T-2018-2223 would require the NYPD to provide notice to minors included in the criminal, criminals, criminal groups database, also known as a gang database. This bill represents a small but crucial first step to achieving transparency and oversight of a law enforcement tool that raises a lot of concerns about policing and racial equity in this city. I was particularly alarmed last year to learn that almost 10% of the individuals who the NYPD keeps track of because they believe that that person is involved with a gang are under 18 years old, with some as young as 13 and 14 years old. We also learned that those kids who are entered into the database are not reevaluated until their 23rd birthday. That means that these young kids, and they are pretty much all young black and Latino kids, 99 cent to be exact, 
grow up being tracked and surveilled, may be arrested more frequently for minor conduct, may be subject to other collateral consequences for their entire teenage lives. And that's true, even if they have never been convicted of a crime, because a criminal record is not a prerequisite to entry into the database. Let me pause here and clarify one thing. I am not ignoring the harms of gang violence. It's a problem in the very communities we have perpetually left behind. Many of the residents in those communities, including mines, want the NYPD to take action against those individuals who are responsible for violence. I'm not saying that the NYPD shouldn't investigate and arrest people who are responsible for violence, and I'm not saying that keeping track of those individuals is in and of itself an invalid law enforcement tool. But I am saying that when there is a history of racially biased policing, in this city that has caused far more collateral consequences for people of color that we have to ensure we are not criminalizing people for having friendships and family members in certain zip codes, wearing certain colors or posing in pictures with people from your block and posting them on Facebook. There has to be some external oversight about who goes into this database and who comes out and why. There has to be some discussion about what is a good reason to label someone a gang member. I believe that this bill is a good place to start. I think we need to give our young people a chance to choose a different life, and we need to give them some due process, a chance to clear their names when they are incorrectly suspected of gang involvement. Our hearing last fall was the beginning of the conversation about how we police gangs. This bill is the beginning of the conversation about what we at the council are obligated to do to make sure that these law enforcement tactics do not perpetuate the criminalization of black and brown folks. There are certainly other issues with the gang database that I've alluded to that may warrant further legislation. But for today, I look forward to having a robust discussion about how we can use notifications to minors and their parents as a tool to communicate to these young people that we are concerned about the choices that they are making. We should be focusing on getting them back on track rather than sitting back and waiting for them to make a mistake that will land them in prison. Because we, because we can and we must do better than that. So with that, um, I don't see any other sponsors here of these bills, so we will go to our first panel and want to welcome uh, NYPD Executive Director Oleg Cheranovsky, Chara still learning that, um, and Assistant uh, Chief James Essig uh, from the NYPD. Um, so I want to thank you for being here, and you may begin uh, your testimony. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer all questions to the best of your ability? Yes. <clears throat> good, af good afternoon, Chair Richards and members of the Council. I am Oleg Chernovsky, Executive Director of Legislative Affairs for the NYPD. I'm joined here by Assistant Chief James Essig of the NYPD's Detective Bureau. On behalf of Police Commissioner James O'Neill, I wish to thank the Council for the opportunity to comment on the bills being heard today. We see every day how neighborhood policing translates to building trust and solidifying relationships between the police and the communities we serve. These collaborative efforts between the NYPD and those that live in, work in, and visit New York City make the city a better place, a safer place. However, we must never forget that, first and foremost, the mission of the NYPD is to fight crime. We have driven crime to historic low, lows while at the same time reducing enforcement to levels rarely, if ever, seen in big cities. Neighborhood policing has transformed how we fight crime by partnering with those we serve, allowing us to share information and more effectively solve cases and precisely deploy our resources. We know that a small fraction of our population commit a large portion of the crime in this city. This is why precision policing focuses on finding and arresting the few who weaken the fabric of our neighborhoods through violence and intimidation. Criminal groups operating on our streets are the drivers of significant portion of the violence and drug trafficking in our city. These criminal groups, be they large organized groups or smaller crews, hold pockets of our city hostage, terrorizing law-abiding citizens who live under a constant cloud of fear. Fear of stray bullets, 
fear of getting robbed, fear that their children will fall under this spell and, and fall victim to the violence they inflict on one another. Today, more and more of the violent crime stems from these crews. They, they are often specific to a neighborhood, a block, or even a single building in a housing development. These crews present unique challenges to law enforcement because they lack, their lack of a defined structure makes it difficult to predict their activities or document their associations, but they remain at least as dangerous as their larger, more structured counterparts. Our long-term criminal group investigations are the very definition of precision policing, and their usefulness cannot be overstated. The results speak for themselves. When we do large takedowns, shootings drop precipit precipitously. A takedown of three crews in the 2-6 precinct resulted in a 50% drop in shootings over the next three years. In the 100th and 101st precincts, shootings dropped 41% in the 18 months following a major gang takedown. This is no accident. None of this would be possible without our ability to gather information on the structures and memberships of these groups. To dismantle a criminal organization, we must understand its size and scope, who its members are, and what crimes the members are, have committed. What was once stored in file cabinets, on index cards, and on display boards is now compiled in the NYPD's criminal group database. Collecting data on members of criminal organizations is nothing new, and we must adapt the times to, to the times and the technology available to us. However, our responsibility is to ensure that everyone is that everyone who is in the database is actually affiliated with a criminal group. In this era of precision policing, a database saturated with individuals with no criminal group affiliation would severely limit its usefulness. Let me be clear about what the database is and what it is not. It is a diligently maintained picture of the existing active universe of criminal groups and their membership that are operating in this city. We have established safeguards to ensure that those unaffiliated with a criminal group are not ensnared into the database. Likewise, these safeguards ensure that those that choose to leave the gang lifestyle are removed from the database. The numbers back this up. 90.6% of our gang members have been arrested for at least one felony. 75.6% have been arrested for at least one index crime. 50.8% have been arrested for at least one robbery. In fact, the average person in the database has been arrested 11.7 times. 686 of our gang members have been arrested for murder, and the individuals residing in the database collectively are responsible for over 19,100 robberies. Already this year, they have been arrested for approximately 3,219 felonies. Our active gang members have been involved in over 4,600 shootings or homicides on either side of the gun. More than 2,500 of our gang members have been shot at least once. There are rigid safeguards to, for inclusion and a multi-tiered review system before someone is included in the database. Mere suspicion or hearsay will not land anyone in the database. This structure creates oversight to ensure that multiple investigators who have actual gang ex expertise agree that a person should be included. This review is also ongoing after entry to make sure that gang members who are no longer in the life are removed. Each person in the database is reviewed every three years, as well as on their 23rd and 28th birthdays to determine if their actions and records still warrant their inclusion. Additionally, the department has a mechanism for self-initiated review at any time. Inclusion in the database is not evidence of a crime, it is a lead. Being in the database alone is not grounds for a stop, an arrest, or any other enforcement action. It is not made public and does not affect the public standing or reputations of the people included since it can only be accessed by NYPD personnel. It does not show show up in a person's criminal history or rap sheet when that person is fingerprinted. Information is not shared with NYCHA or, or employers conducting background checks or educational institutions, and the department does not share this information with Immigration and Customs Enforcement. 
New York State does not permit civil gang injunctions such as those routinely utilized in California. Unlike many states, New York does not have a sentencing enhancement for gang members. Finally, New York does not have a statute that makes it illegal merely to be in a gang. A person's presence in the NYPD criminal group database simply does not have the collateral consequences seen in other jurisdictions. I would now like to address various pieces of legislation being heard today. Preconsidered intro T2018-2223 would require the NYPD to notify minors under 18 of their inclusion in the criminal group database unless doing so would impede an ongoing investigation and give them an, an avenue to appeal their inclusion. The department respectfully opposes this legislation to the extent it requires disclosure of investig investigatory invest information. As I explained earlier in my testimony, safeguards against erroneous inclusion are already in place. Although this bill acknowledges that providing notifications to individuals in the database would impede investigations and seeks to avoid this result, the bill would nevertheless accomplish just that. Including a qualifying individual in the database is a lead in an investigation, nothing more, nothing less. It would make no sense to divulge intelligence gathered during the course of an ongoing short-term or lo long-term investigation. Sending a letter to anyone in the database would not only alert them that they are the subject of investigation, but would alert their criminal group that we are aware of its existence and potentially the identities of its membership. The department shares the goal of the, bill spo of the bill's sponsor, which is to dissuade youth from following the wrong path in life. This is why the department has both spearheaded and partnered with stakeholders on a variety of youth programs to achieve just that goal. Programs such as the Summer Youth Police Academy, with over 2,000 participants between the age of 10 and 15. The Youth Leadership Council, aimed at high school students ages 14 to 20 years old. The Law Enforcement Ex Explorers Program, with over 2,000 participants between the ages of 14 and 20 the Summer Youth Employment Program, which provides summer jobs to 300 youth citywide between the ages of 14 and 24. The My School Has Rhythm Not Violence Program, which has 720 participants between the ages of 14 and 20 since 2015. The PAL Cops and Kids Sports League, which provides recreational spaces and summer and after school programs for youth throughout the city. A variety of presentations, outreach, and forums through, throughout each year by police officers on subjects such as bullying, drugs, gang prevention, internet safety, personal safety, stranger danger, and teen dating violence, to name just a few. The police commissioner for a day es essay contest for high school students and opening this fall in 2019 our youth community center located at 127 Pennsylvania Avenue, which will serve as a safe haven for youth between the ages of 14 and 19 years old and provide a series of workshops encompassing educational, social, and recreational resources. This is not an exhaustive list. Utilizing technology such as the criminal group database is vital to keeping the city safe. It helps the department connect the dots after crime is committed and anticipate retaliatory acts before they occur. However, in the modern world, technology, both, technology works both for and against us. Turning to the other proposals before the committee, the threat that ghost guns and 3D guns pose to our ability to fight crime cannot be overstated. These are guns that do not contain a serial number and cannot be traced. The parts and instructions to make these guns are readily available online and are legal to purchase. Few states have acted, few states have acted to ban the sale and possessions of these dangerous weapons, and the recently introduced federal bill to do so has languished in committee. Intro 1553 would make it a crime to possess the unfinished receiver of a firearm without a serial number. We have all witnessed the steep decline in the number of shootings and murders that occur in this city. These achievements are due in no small part to this state's strict gun laws and law enforcement's ability to trace illegal firearms and legal firearms used for illegal ends. 
allowing untraceable firearms and component parts to enter the stream of commerce will promote their use and at the same time stymie law enforcement's ability to effectively trace such weapons used during the course of a crime. The department supports this proposal and looks forward to working with its sponsors to ensure the final version is legally sound. Intro 1548 would require the NYPD to report on the number of 3D printed guns and ghost guns seized. The department supports the goal of greater transparency and believes this proposal is consistent with such a goal. I will, ne I will turn next to Intro 1244. The Me Too era has helped us all become cognizant of threats to women's ability to feel safe and feel and free from violence and harassment which may have previously been swept under the rug. Unfortunately, technolo technological advances have given sexual predators another tool to target. Excuse me. Unfortunately, technological advances have given sexual predators another tool to target unsuspecting victims. The ability of these nefarious individuals to airdrop pictures or videos of a sexual nature into innocent people's phones is the latest technique being employed to intentionally harass, annoy, alarm, and intimidate their victims. Intro 1244 would make such desp despicable activity a crime and provide the department with an enforcement tool to bring such criminals to justice before they strike again. The department supports this legislation. Intro 635 would prohibit transporting a person in custody for the purpose of allowing the person to be photographed or filmed for the benefit of the media known as a perp walk. The department transports individuals in a manner consistent with applicable law and in the normal course of duty, with the primary goal being to facilita facilitate a safe transfer. Many department facilities have one primary avenue of ingress and egress. Other facilities, like our sex crimes facilities, are purposely designed to ensure victims and perpetrators do not use the same entrance or exit, thereby ensuring that a perpetrator always uses the same path. The presence of media at these entry or exit points would effectively subject officers and detectives to allegations of violating this bill, should it become law, if they simply use a particular door. The department is constrained to oppose this legislation, not based on its intent, which is consistent with current department practices, but with its foreseeable impact on routine prisoner transports, which will need to be altered based on the presence of a video camera in, clo clo in close proximity to a police facility, over which the department has no control. Finally, Intro 567 would require the NYPD to establish purchase exchange locations at a precinct, at a precinct house or some other public location within the precinct boundaries, which must be monitored by humans, presumably officers, or video surveillance. While the department supports the goal of this legislation, we oppose this bill as currently written. Many of our facilities are over 50 years old and are limited for space. The department must balance this limited space with the operational needs of a police facility, which include the safe movement and intake of prisoners, the need to protect the identity of and, in and interview crime victims and witnesses, the ability to allow complainants to file reports, the ability of members of the public who require police services to request such services, and the need to turn out police officers to patrol our streets. We appreciate the need for a safe environment within which to conduct commercial transactions. We would support an educational campaign aimed at creating public awareness with respect to, this type, to these type of locations where these transactions could take place. But as drafted, this bill would not be operationally feasible for the department. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about these important issues, and we look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Oleg, and I want to uh, recognize my colleagues. We're joined by uh, Power, Brandon, Rodriguez, Borelli, and Miller, and I'm going to go to first Councilmember Borelli for his statement, and then I will go to Councilmember Miller for a statement as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for co-sponsoring uh, Intro 1244. Now, uh, just a, a brief uh, note, Councilmember Powers advised me not to do this, but I'm going to do this anyway, and I'm just going to start airdropping a little note to several people in this room, which the service is not that good. 
But there's seven of you now within range uh, of my airdrop and have your settings on uh, to the point where you can accept uh, and see any images that I send you. Uh, don't, don't get too excited. It's only the cover sheet of today's hearing. The problem is that this is not being used to send city council cover sheets. Oftentimes this is being done on subways and trains and airplanes and restaurants uh, to send lewd uh, and harassing images uh, that some of us, uh, namely me, uh, I prefer would not see or my wife sees or my children sees. Uh, and up until this point, there is no effective crime to charge people with this uh, with, with this which we all could define as a crime, but there is no actual statutory prohibition against this. So this bill is important because it will set up uh, a way that law enforcement can actually enforce uh, the kinds of quality of life harassment and uh, offensive behaviors that we all too often see. Uh, in, in my day, uh, you had to have really fast running shoes if you wanted to be a pervert, uh, but now unfortunately through social media and through phones and through technology, uh, it's much easier. So I'm glad the council is addressing this and uh, thank you very much, Chair, for co-sponsoring and hearing the bill. Thank you. We'll go to Councilmember Miller. Thank I'm you, glad Chair. not to get your picture, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chair Richards. Uh, New York City is a national leader in, in gun violence prevention and the City Council has been at the forefront of such efforts locally partnership with the Mayor's Office to prevent gun violence and community groups such as those that make up the crisis management system and the violence interrupters. The City will surrender its leadership role will not su surrender its leadership role on the issues on these issues and through legislation that will be heard today we are taking proactive steps to prevent potential for violence at resulting of the use of ghost guns. Ghost guns and its 3D print guns can be purchased or their designs downloaded without background checks or are unregistered and virtually untraceable to law enforcement. While Congress and the state legislators continue to debate the issues of ghost guns, the city council will take actions now. Along with my partner, on the legislation, Helen Rosenthal and the leadership of Chair Richards, I'm sponsoring intro 1548, which would both for ghost guns and 3D prints to the M cause NYPD's quarterly firearm seizure reporting requirements. Currently, the department reporting only includes three types of firearms classification, pistols, rifles, and shotguns. This report must be updated to reflect the new reality and threat posed by the proliferation of ghost guns. Additionally, I'm sponsoring 866, which calls for the federal Reso 866, which calls for the federal federal government to enact 3D firearm prohibition act to prohibit the sales, acquisition, distribution, or import of these firearms parts and kits. The marketing of such kits and would require homemade firearms to have serial numbers. No one should have unrestricted access to do-it-yourself kits and equipment designed to make and assemble weapons of war, such as rifles, semi-automatic handguns. But while we continue to, they go, to continue to go unregulated, most of America, they will be illegal here in New York City. Recent arrests in New Jersey show that the underground market for these 21st century weapons exists, and there are legal loopholes that have been exploited by gun runners and drug traffickers. It's only a matter of time before such activity comes to our streets here in New York City. We must give law enforcement the tools that they need to arrest gun owners such as this, confiscate their weapons, determine the availability of ghost guns here in New York City. Again, I want to thank Chair Richards for his leadership and Councilmember Roland Stoll and, of course, Speaker Johnson for uh, getting this, hearing this today. So, thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you. And we're going to go to questions, no statements. Okay. Um, start, Oleg, with um, as of last September, around 1,400 of the 17,000 individuals in the criminal groups database were under 18. That's about 8.5%. Has that percentage changed significantly since our last hearing? And uh, are they still, where are, where are, what are the numbers now? Has the numbers gone up in the database? Can you just give us an overview of where we're at? Sure. So uh, in terms of percentage of um, individuals, the, the total number of active uh, criminal group members are uh, just over 18,000, 18,084. 
Uh, the percentage of individuals that are under 18 is 2.7 percent. So the numbers have gone up. Well, from I, last year, I think from September's hearing, I think we were at a total of 17,000 individuals. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think the, it's, it's worth mentioning that um, if we take a look at, we'll take a snapshot of 2018 and take a look at how many individuals were added, how many individuals were removed to give some context. Um, criminal group members added in 2018 were 2,475. Criminal group members removed in 2018 was 2,125. So there was, uh, I think the difference is about 350 individuals, but it shows that um, our review process, and I just want to highlight that, we have auto triggers and self-initiated triggers for review. So the automatic triggers to uh, review somebody for uh, exclusion, for removal from the database is their 23rd birthday, their 28th birthday, and every three years. So for argument's sake, if I put you into the database on January 1st of 2015, you will come up automatically for review on January 1st of 2018, irrespective of your birthday or not. In addition to that, there is a self-initiated review process. So if uh, our, our criminal group or gang experts uh, determined based on their investigations that somebody in the database has left the life, uh, for lack of a better term, they can initiate their removal without waiting for the automatic benchmarks of three years and the birthdays. Um, can you break down the age groups of the individuals, the percentages, the under 18 especially? So, right, so um, we have uh, so, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Chief. Hey, that's out of the 18,000 members, uh, 494 are under the age of 18. 266 are 17. Uh, 145, 16. 61, 15, 19. Oh, Blow up sorry. a little bit. Yeah, so under at 17 is yeah, 266. Yeah, it's about 2.7% 2, 2 under 17. No, and we're, give me the exact Under numbers. 18, I'm sorry. So under 18. is 2.7%. Right, but break down the numbers. Uh, by percentage, 17. No, 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 is, give, oh, me, give me exact numbers, numbers of how many people are uh, in camp. By 17, 266. Mm -hmm. 16, 145. Mm -hmm. 15, 61. Mm -hmm. 14, 19. And 13, 3. And that seems like, it, and just give me the breakdown from the last hearing. So in September, how many of, of last year when we had the original database hearing, what were the numbers? Yeah, there? I don't, uh, I mean, I think we entered that into the record. I didn't bring last it year. This seems like an increase of where we were. There, yeah, I think the, the overall increase is correct. It's a slight increase of it looks like about 350 individuals. We removed, uh, hold on, we removed 2,125 but added 2,475. So unless my math is off, I think we have a net gain of 350. So the total number is how many in the database? Total number in the database is um, 18,084. And how many under 18? Under 18... That'll be 494. So 494. And can you just go through, so, so how do you determine which groups to track? In other words, what makes a group of people into a gang that the department needs to pay attention to and starts entering into the database? Uh, most of these gangs, they're self-identified. They're criminal street groups involved in narcotics involved in street robberies, involved in violence, uh, uh, so, any, any sort of violence. Some of them involved in f frauds, credit card frauds. They self-identify as a gang. So whether you're dealing narcotics or a local gang that's identified by territory, that's how we identify them. Right. And are you positive each and every person in this database is a gang member? Can you say on the record that every person entered into this database, are you confident well, that each so, and every one of them are? Yeah, so I mean, I think th that's what the safeguards are there for, right? So we have 
to remove close to 2,200, just over 2,100 people in a year, it shows that we're actively looking at it. Now, the criteria and, and how does somebody come in, right? You need to be recommended. So you need to show certain criteria, right? And then the, with the presence of that criteria, you, can, you can't be recommended by a street cop, right? You could be recommended by a field intelligence officer that has their expertise in, in gangs, or you could, be, um, you could be recommended by a gang unit investigator. Once you're recommended, there is still a review process. You have to make sure the criteria that are being met. Otherwise, the system won't even allow you to enter the person into the database. And then you need, it needs to be approved. The recommendation needs to be approved by the gang captain of a particular borough who has an even heightened, uh, he's the executive of the borough in gang activity. So w those are the benchmarks that you need to accomplish to merely get in. And then you start, there are other benchmarks that gets you out. So, so give me, give me, just give me an example of what criteria looks like. I mean, you have things like voluntary admission uh, during the course of an investigation to independent law enforcement sources uh, determine that you are in a gang. This is during the course of their investigation. It's not somebody merely in the street that are saying, I know he's a, or she's a gang member. Um, you have things like, uh, and the, I mean, those are some of them, social media indicators indicating membership. Um, you have other things that, those are criteria that as long as you have one of those, you can get recommended. Uh, then there is another way to go through it, which is if you have two of uh, whether it's a, a known um, a gang related documents, association with uh, group members, social media accounts uh, with group members, scars or tattoos, uh, you know, with gang colors, gang signs. So it's the presence of multiple of those factors, uh, plus the recommendation of a gang investigative expert, plus the approval of a gang, uh, uh, gang expert executive. And um, we actually pulled the numbers, so it looks like 1,400 minors were in the database last year. So it's, it seems like you've made some progress in decreasing the numbers, but there are specific targeted, um, uh, targeted uh, initiative to ensure te teens are being taken out of the database since you went from 1,700 to 494, it looks like. Yeah, I mean, I'll t after the and, hearing, and I'll take. A, I'll take a, I, I really didn't draw the right. comparison, so I don't want to. I don't want to say that, but I, I support the numbers that you've uh, right. put forward. Yeah, as we long we as pulled accurate. them from the record. So, okay. so the point is, you pulled over two thousand individuals in a, a little bit, I guess, edging towards a year. Um, tell me about why those individuals, and I guess you can't go into specific cases, but why? How did you get to such a drastic decrease? Would you say that a lot of them may not have belonged in it or no. what, what led you to such no. a steep I, I wouldn't say that at all production so, so fast I think what we said even at the last hearing if my memory serves me right is we set benchmarks and criteria for removal a, a database that only has us putting people into it and it grows larger and larger is useless as an investigative tool. If you have people that are no longer in the gang lifestyle or left or for, for any reason, to have them in the database only convolutes an investigation. It's, it's, it, it wouldn't help us. So the idea is to be vigilant in reviewing who's in there, be vigilant in establishing strict criteria for getting entered in the first place. So you have a database that's lean, that you can go to so if you have a gang related shooting we can take a look and say okay we know the shooter is from this gang who else is in that gang we can see who is the victim is the victim in the gang who else is in that gang that's going to potentially seek retribution against one of the shooters gang members or or so that that's the usefulness you're i mean just to say that oh it's gang on gang violence and it's not uh, uh uninvolved civilian 
doesn't make us feel better, you know, going home. We want to stop the violence. The fact that a gang member is getting killed, that's still a homicide, that's still a person getting killed. If we, if we could prevent that, if we could interdict in the right place and identify who the universe of potential victims could be or potential shooters, that's what the gang, gang database is or the criminal group database is all about. And I guess my concern is and when you use that word association, right, because if you live in let's say public housing in New York City or you come from a specific neighborhood, um, you know, you may walk to school with people who are affiliated. Um, would you be entered into this database? No. So, I, so, if you, so if you, so when you say association, just, just go a little deeper into that. Because, you know, I went to Jamaica High School and there were a lot of affiliated individuals from my specific neighborhood. By the grace of God, my parents were able to, when they saw me go on a different path, um, you know, move me out. But would I have been entered into a database if the guys, if I walked to school with the guys on my block and came home and, you know, walked to the bus stop on Jamaica Avenue with them, would I be considered or, or be put into this database because I would be considered affiliated although I'm not necessarily in the gang no so uh, and the, and how do you how do you ensure that doesn't happen as well that, that's that's actually that's the criteria right so if all you have is an affiliation or an association that in itself will not get you in the database that won't even get you recommended for being put in the database so if all you have so is a, uh, just just to stop you so you said you have who oversees you have a gang unit mm -hmm. so if they saw me walking to school with individuals that person wouldn't consider me, not saying I'm in the gang, but I would not be put into this database for that reason, is what you're saying. I, would I have, what, what, what is the threshold for being put into the database? So the, the threshold is when you're talking about association with a known gang, right, that in itself would not get you into the database. You have to have other factors present. Let's say you have a gang tattoo, you're, uh, you're associated, plus you have gang tattoos. What are the gang but, tattoo? Would, it, would I have to have Crips written on me? Or? Well, I, I mean, look, the, I think the, I, I think yeah, we, we would... We a would lot agree, of people have tattoos. We would agree that, I, yeah. I would hope we would agree okay. that if, you know, we have a gang unit whose sole purpose is to track gangs and criminal groups mm -hmm. that are terrorizing this city. They, through their intelligence gathering, through their investigations, they know what tags, gang tags are, spray painting on buildings to mark territory. They know what tat identifying tattoos are. I mean, that's intelligence that they gather. If tad new tattoos come about, that's intelligence that's gonna lead us to recognize the fact that a particular gang has a new tattoo. So, I mean, these are all investigative leads that we determine. The, if you have a tattoo that says, I love mom, I don't think you're, that's gonna be, uh, <laughs> that's gonna enter you into a database. 99% um, of individuals still in this database are black and Latino. I think you reported that last. Can you give me the, per the percentage? Sure. And is that still true today? Uh, percentages, American Indian, Alaskan Native, uh, there's four persons, zero percent. Amer Wait, say that again slow. You, you talk fast. Oh, slow. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, American Indian is zero percent. Asian Pacific Islanders, 0.5 percent. Black, 66 percent. Black Hispanic, 9.3 percent. Uh, white, 1.1 percent. White Hispanic, 22.4 percent. So 66 percent black, white 1.1 percent. Um, so 98 percent and a half communities of color, and we're positive that only there are only 1.1 percent white people in gangs in New York. City. So I, I mean I think that's that, that's misleading. So let me let's address let's address this head on. The NYPD does not control recruitment for criminal groups. Now, if the council member wants to hold a hearing about diversity and recruitment efforts, you know, in these groups, we'll be in the audience taking notes. But realistically, we find these groups as, as they come. Now, if you take a look at traditional organized crime, right, things that we've all watched movies about, 
those, if you take a look at our, our intel on those particular groups and organizations, they would be disproportionately, if not exclusively, white. And we don't control their recruitment efforts either. These are investigative leads. So the way that a particular criminal group chooses to do their recruitment, we will take those leads as they come into us. If we're looking at a particular group and that group decided to recruit exclusively or predominantly uh, young men of color, uh, that's our intelligence or our gathering is going to reflect that. Uh, there's really not much control we have over that. But I guess the concern would be that certain communities are surveilled more than other communities. Um, so if there's a heavy emphasis on black and brown communities getting surveilled, we may be missing a whole lot. Are the Proud Boys in this gang database? Are they considered a gang? I don't know. Uh, I'll. I can confirm that for you. I don't, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, they very well may be. I'm, it's I'm a not. poor answer. I think they're a gang. Well, no, that I can you double check. Yeah, we, I'm, I'm not going to say yes or no, but I, I let me double check. I'll let you know. So would white supremacists to wreak, wreak havoc on our wreak havoc on our streets, would they be put in this database? Sure. But you're not positive if. Oh, I'm, I'm double. I mean, I don't want to say you, you mentioned the particular group. I, I want to make sure before I answer under oath that, that the answer Could is yes. You, right. So would, so would organized crime units, uh, crime get people be considered a gang? So, well? so that's they. Uh, so here's the difference. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a yes and no. And this is uh, it's a yes in terms of it's a criminal group. Uh, in terms of inclusion into the local database, it is a no, and there's a good reason for that. So if you take a look at traditional organized crime, they operate across state and international borders. Those investigations are predominantly, if not almost exclusively, done as part of a joint venture with the federal government, and they're stored separately uh, in, in, a, a, in a different method. Uh, the criminal group database is more a tracking mechanism for local street groups. Now, to the extent that it's a white local street group or uh, a black and Hispanic local street group, they're going to find themselves in the local street group database because those are almost exclusively uh, NYPD-led investigations. These are NYPD leads. They don't cross state or international borders. So that's why, if, and that was my earlier point, if what you're going to do is take a look at, for example, um, you know, how we track these traditional organized groups, what you're going to find is pre predominantly, if not exclusively, uh, white. So the organized crime database. Yeah, there's uh, there's tracking mechanisms for traditional. It's called the organized crime data. Well, I don't, I didn't name it, so I'm not sure what it's called, but I can tell you. And, that and would they do very similar things? I mean, define what a gang is. Can you define what it what it means? Do we have a definition of a gang? So we have, uh, I mean, we have these, we have the factors that I put on the record for you. Uh, that's what would have somebody identified as a gang member. So I would say it's a collection of the same criteria that um, that would have you that would have a particular group designated as a gang. Okay. Well, I, I'm just going to say this. I mean, you get my gist that um, you know if you're, as you said, a group of individuals who seem to be committing fraud. I think you said and guns and drugs. I mean, I don't really see much daylight between a gang and people in an organized crime, necessarily. I think they're see, gang members, too. Well, we don't. Um, uh, I just want to clarify, I, I did not say that there is daylight. These yeah. are groups committing crimes. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying the tracking mechanism is different because the nature of the investigations are different. One is local and one is done collaboratively with the federal government because the, cri the crimes of traditional organized crime are of such a nature that they cross boundaries. And when you cross boundaries, you need to pull in the law enforcement entities that are on the other side of that boundary. That that's really the. But I would also say that there there are investigations in NYCHA where there's a lot of collaboration with 
other entities such as federal, the feds as well, right? Sure. You know, when takedown says, so I don't, you know, I'm just trying to understand how this number is 1.1% white when we know there's a whole, a whole lot more out there. I'm going to move from that. Um, but, you know, wh what I'm getting at is there's this historical relationship, right? And what I, our key goal is to make sure that there are innocent young black and men who are not being dragged into this database, especially um, teenagers, especially who we should be diverting services to um, and doing everything we can possibly do to ensure that they're being connected to services so they're not stigmatized and they, if they get in trouble for a minor crime, they're not, their, pace, their case is not being padded or they're not being considered a danger to public safety over something low level so, being yeah. flagged in that database. Do district attorneys have access to this database? No. So, and no, they don't. And to okay. your point, we're in agreement with you. I, I mean, I just want to make sure that you understand there's no daylight in that respect. I mean, our opposition to the bill is the fact that we are looking at particular groups, particular individuals to let somebody know that, hey, you're a lead in an investigation and here's an, a mechanism for you to appeal being a lead in an investigation. Th that's just incongruent with the ability for us to investigate crime. Now, to your point of getting folks uh, and getting kids on the right path, I listed a variety, and that's not an exhaustive list of programs, and you know because you partnered with us on some of them, of programs we do in order to get kids on the right path, in order to get to make to ensure that they never enter into a criminal group in the first place, or at least to educate them on the dangers if if they're approached by criminal groups trying to recruit them. So we're on the same page when it comes when it comes to interdicting and trying to get kids on the right path. And I think our actions and our programs reflect that. Okay, I'm going to go to my colleagues for questions in a second, um, but I do want to know with these 494 individuals in the current database what outreach what services are you directly connecting them to so i heard some of youth and that's very vague um because some of these individuals may not even be in school so are you know we have programs like the crisis management system is it has there been a strategic effort made to target these kids and i don't want a broad interpretation of you yeah, know. no, it's, it's, I'm, I'm going to be very direct with you. I, I think that um, there is an effort made uh, to the extent that somebody's a lead and we cannot, um, we cannot advertise that lead, then I would probably say that outside of a um, normal outreach, not a specific focused outreach on the individual, but our broader outreach to the communities, uh, then you'd probably have, that's the, that would be the limitation on the outreach. If you have individuals that we deem uh, that, you know, they can come out of the database or that it would not hamper an investigation, there may very well be a direct outreach at the point of them being removed or even at the point that they would be in there. But again, that decision is going to be based on, uh, you know, our review of the situation and whether or not doing so would compromise a larger investigation. Right. And out of those 20, over 2,000 people that were removed, do you send a notification to them that they're removed? Is there a process for communities or teenagers or their parents to find out if they're in a database and be removed or to appeal? Well, no, I think, but that's, that's really the point, is this is an investigative lead. We're not going to, you know, we never advertise to, to those folks that they were a lead in an investigation, and nor do we uh, in any crime that we investigate. We don't tell somebody that's a suspect in an investigation, hey, you're a suspect in an investigation, and here's a letter, you stopped being a suspect in the investigation today. It's, that's just not the way investigations are but what run. if I wanted to know, how do I find out I if mean, I was in a database? Yeah, is, I mean, is there a process to do that? No, because that's an investigative lead, and to answer that question would potentially compromise an investigation. But if I'm not in a gang and I wanted to appeal, and I believe that you've entered me into this database because I'm being stopped on the street more, um, you know, are teenagers targeted more if they're in this database? No. no. Are they followed? Are they interrogated? No. Or I, if there's a shooting, would they? Would you show up at their doors? I mean, if I 
look, I can tell you that if you have a shooting, if you have criminal activity, and it's our intelligence or our investigative leads lead us to believe that the shooting was committed by a particular gang, and here is the universe of the gang members we're aware of, well, certainly, maybe they're going to be approached and spoken to in the context of the investigation. It won't be in the context of, you know, we know that you're in a gang. It could be, you know. But would you, but so what I'm getting at, parental notification, would you notify the parent before you had that conversation? Well, I, I think... Well, you're if, you're 18, ta- if you're talking about a minor, minors. I mean that that's it, interrogating a minor has has a protocol for for interrogating a juvenile, you know. So those are the protocols that you follow. But you would, but that has not always historically. I don't have to go to the innocent Central Park Five, right, to have this conversation. And I'm not saying that this is continuing to happen, but we certainly saw that, you know, in the past. So are we positive that if these children are being entered into the database and you want to interrogate them, that their parents are being um, notified. So, I mean, I know attempts are made to notify the parents. I can get you, I'll get you the patrol guide procedure uh, related to interrogation of juveniles. Uh, maybe that, that'll more comprehensively answer right. your question. Right. And I say that to say, but it's you done know. based on, I, just to be clear, it's done based on established state law. There's many strings of case many strings of case law that address the exact topic of juvenile interrogation. Right. That's what's followed. Our patrol guide procedure and our procedures reflect the evolution of case law. Uh, so. Right. And I'll just, I'm going to close on this and I'll come back around. But, you know, I do have concern with minors being entered into this database and no parental notification obviously because these are individuals who possibly can, I'm not saying in all instances, be approached on the street because they would be flagged as known gang members. So I think there would be, um, especially for, I'm sure there are sectors that cover certain communities. If you are flagged in this database for just being associated or not even being a gang member, it does intensify and um, increase the chances that you will be stopped by an officer. That, that's not true. It's, it's, it, I mean, I'm sorry, but that's, I, I need to correct right. it. It's, that's not true. The fact that you're in the gang database, in the criminal group database, does not, does not mean that if I see you walking down the street, if a police officer sees you walking down the street, they're going to stop you. That's not what it means. It's an investigative lead. If there's a shooting and we know that a particular criminal group did the shooting or the particular criminal group is going to be retaliated against as a result of a shooting, we're going to know the universe of people that we either, one, need to interview or two, need to intervene and protect. Right. But but what my concern with that, and once again, that's good, but just making sure that there's parental, you know, notification if you're going to interrogate. All right, I'm going to go to my colleagues, um, Powers, into Miller. All right. And we're joined by Councilmember Deutsch. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to ask questions. Thank you for the testimony. Um, following up on some of the questions from the chair, uh, so one, one question I have is, as we're talking about enforcement, is there a way that like a patrol officer, for instance, would know there's a gang unit who has access to this information? Is there a, is there a place where a patrol officer, for instance, would have access to that to know? To stop, if the concern is around stopping somebody based on affiliation, is there a, a, a way that or a mechanism that that person would be able to have that information and in terms of in terms of the concern around stops? Yeah, somebody somebody at the precinct could, uh, has access, could access to it, it, but they're not going to stop somebody just simply because he's in a database. Um, okay. Um, the are there other similar databases where it's an it's um not about necessarily a co- crime you committed but about an affiliation organized crime for instance yeah i mean and that's what we were talking about uh they're certainly tracked um i i mean uh i'm thinking uh domestic violence uh recidivists uh but those are about you have committed a offense this one, even if somebody has a criminal affili- has a, a criminal background, well, but that's that's an inter- that that's an interesting point. Is you know, say for example, if you're looking at domestic violence, and we know that there is a, you know, there's a significant number of domestic violence uh, incidents that where the victim doesn't doesn't follow through. So if they don't if they don't if they don't follow through in terms of 
pursuing a, like a criminal right, charge. Against but we at the same time know that maybe our domestic violence officers should do a home visit. You know, it's 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 a normal occurrence, unfortunately, for if you have spouses, or domestic partners, for uh, for a situation to be escalated, for the police to be called, and then ultimately the victim doesn't follow through or wants to drop charges. At the same time, if we see a pattern of such activity, maybe it would be beneficial for the victim of DV to have a domestic violence officer visit to make sure he or she are issue, are offered services. You know, so there are there are avenues. You know, there are other examples where is there an organized crime database? Yeah, it's, we do that collaboratively with our federal partners, just again, based on the nature of those investigations crossing state and federal lines, uh, crossing state lines and international lines. So what uh, in, in terms of federal cooperation are there? Is this is information from the gang database shared with any federal agencies or federal databases? No, I mean, and that's that's the point. The NYPD has ex exclusive access to our own database. We don't share access to our database with immigration or uh, with ICE or or DAs, as you've mentioned. No, and no, no, uh, no federal agency has. Nobody has access to our database other than NYPD. And I assume if they had a warrant or something like that, or they had an open investigation, they could come to you and ask you for they can, that information. Right. They can come based on the warrant. They The warrant would not grant them access to the database. They would okay. not grant them access to information. Um, and on the, um, just back to the point around the DV, I, I would note that I think there is still a difference between affiliation and in, in the DV instance, you're talking about an instance where somebody has done something. I understand that the spouse may not be, or the partner may not be, pursuing a charge, but I think you're still, you're still addressing a situation based on an event that, oh, you're sorry, you're sort of still have a database based on an event that happened versus an affiliation. Well, uh, but that's, that, that's important. It's the day, the criminal group database is not based on an affiliation. So if we're, if we're drawing the correlation to something happening, then the individuals, and I went through the, the list of crimes that the individuals that populate our criminal group database are responsible for. To be a group, you need to be engaged in in criminal activity. But I'm talking about an individual, not a group. Well, but the so individual- affiliation is- But one individual standing alone is not a criminal group, right? So that individual would be in connection with others, right? They have similar, you know, uh, they identify as we are Group A, we're Gang A, and we have tattoos that have an A on us. We wear Group Gang Group A colors. We have Group A uh, hand signals. We commit crimes as a group, and you know we have territorial disputes. So this is Group A's territory. So there, there are a variety of things that lead you there, uh, and there have been activity, much like you know as we highlight DV, that's one example I'm just really thinking on the fly, but that, that was something that popped out. Um, there's been past action. So over here you have a group has been engaged in past criminal action or current criminal action. Is the, the, the I note that you had, I saw some stats in here about um, the criminal background of 96%, 90.6 have been arrested for at least one felony, 75.6 have been arrested for at least one index crime, 50 point eight percent have been arrested for at least one robbery average person has been arrested 11.7 times those don't mean that those crimes put you into the database necessarily they mean that's you're just calculating the average here of right. the people in it is that correct right and there are individuals I, I i presume who have none of the above yeah yes we have uh less than two percent have less than less than percent have no no arrests okay um the i mean i I, I can accept a lot of what you're saying around the open investigation and the need for the agency to be able to do its work and to both be uh, preventative but also to be able to, um, in, in the case of an incident, to be able to understand the dynamics of play in terms of a gang uh, and understanding the, um, how, to, how to proceed with an investigation. I think that the concern that the chair has raised is who's in it, which is, we've had this conversation in past hearings as well, who's in it, and obviously I, I understand that I, 
sensitive to the concerns that informing somebody they're in it may compromise an open investigation or other actions that the agency has, but at the same time understanding the way somebody gets into it. I think that um, my feeling is when you talk about affiliation, I, I, that is obviously way more discretion. <laughs> There's a lot more discretion involved in that than um, sounds like some of the other databases you're talking about. Yeah, but just just to just to highlight, affili- and that's I I keep repeating this because I think it's an important point to highlight because we we keep focusing on affiliation as being some sort of an automatic trigger to get into into the database. It is not. Mere affiliation will not even get you recommended for inclusion into the database, let alone get you entered into the database. You wouldn't even be recommended. If you were hanging out, as the chair mentioned, if he's hanging out with a couple of people that happen to be in the gang, is he affiliated and now in the gang database? No, he's he's not. That he wouldn't even be recommended for inclusion in the in the criminal group database. Okay, and just remind me one more time, what then would be the criteria for for inclusion? So you have, you know, and I, I know the chair found it hard to believe the last time we had this hearing, but a significant, yeah, a significant number of the folks self self identify, self admit. I mean, that's not an uncommon. That is very a common occurrence, you know, because that is something I, I would assume that gives them stature, you know, so they, they're actually proud of their involvement and they make that admission. So uh, an admission uh, during the course of an investigation by law enforcement, if we have not one but two independent law enforcement sources saying this person is in a gang. So it's not only one investigator, but but two, two law enforcement sources making that determination. Social media indicators indicating uh, membership um, that would get one of those would get you in right so that's the high bar uh, the other option is a combination of the following which could be um, you know uh, gang related documents association with criminal group not standing alone but with other factors uh, social media and the so, uh, association with groups including pictures uh, scars or tattoos associated with a group, colors, hand gestures reflecting, uh, you know, um, uh, association with a group. And it's not one of those things being present. It's a combination of those things being present will only get you to the point of being recommended. It will not get you automatic entry. There is no automatic entry. There is, There are these triggers that will get you recommended by not a mere police officer on the street, by, but by a detective or a field intelligence sergeant that has expertise in gang activity. Will, they will recommend you based on a combination of these factors. And then an executive in the, in the gang unit, the captain of a particular borough, would then have to review that recommendation and evaluate it for inclusion. Again, our goal is to keep that database as lean as possible because an overpopulated database is a useless investigative tool. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, and just um, a final question on this topic, and I have one more after that, is the um, the self-admission, how, what, is the, how, what is the mechanism I want self-identifies, I should say, with uh, if, if somebody gang. was arrested and they're in a precinct and they're gonna be debriefed on crimes in the area, they would self-admit. I'm a blood, I'm a crip, et cetera, et cetera. That's a self-admission. Okay, thank you. Um, just switching topics to a different bill, which came up earlier, um, Councilmember Borelli's legislation around the airdrop, and I will confirm I did tell him not to airdrop to people's phones. Um, uh, the And maybe check my own settings. But um, you're, you're supportive of that legislation race based on the category of picture that's being, uh, or information that's being sent. Is there a more are you are you supportive of a more expansive effort to I mean there's all privacy concerns I, I, there's just two concerns one is you know over regulating mm-hmm. here but also the concern is if there's a concern about people invading other people's personal privacy using technology that's now available does that concern for the NYPD go further than the specific category that Councilman Borelli's bill is discussing? So, I mean, I think we we need to be balanced here. I think we would all agree that, you know, there are implications that uh, we, we need to withstand legal scrutiny 
in order for bills such as this to be able to pass. Um, in the situation of an airdrop, uh, when you confine it to intimate image, uh, you know you have a defined, a defined, easily defined and identifiable subject matter. And if you send it with the intent to harass, annoy, alarm another another individual who's an unwilling recipient, you can pretty accurately identify that. Of course, as law enforcement, we need to still develop the intent of the actor, and we need to develop who was the actual sender, right? So those are challenges, but you know, that's something we're going to need to work through as we work through in every investigation. I think uh, when you talk about a course of conduct, sending somebody uh, messages uh, with intent to harass or annoy or alarm them that don't rise to the level of intimate images, a pattern of conduct would currently fall under the aggravated harassment statute in the penal law. The qu I think the question you're asking is, do you want to have a one text trigger? Yeah. Uh, th that's. The, I mean, you know, that's, both seem unenforceable to me, for what it's worth. But so, uh, right, I but, mean, I think it's. I, I think. Or difficult I, to enforce. I right. There. I mean, these are difficult things to enforce, but it's not. Uh, I don't think it's insurmountable. And having a tool for somebody that's legitimately victimized versus having no tool at all, we'll, we'll choose the option of having a tool and we'll work with our DA partners to try to get a prosecution on it and convince it. Okay. Thank you for t t uh, taking time to answer questions. Thank you, Thank the you. Chair, for your, uh, offering the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Powell. Let's go on to Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, okay. Um, before we, we address the uh, ghost gun legislation, let me just, um, if, if, if someone, we're talking about affiliations and associations, if there were an ongoing investigation and you happen to be walking to school with someone involved in that investigation, if you happen to play some ball in the afternoon beyond that, um, does that then trigger a concern beyond um, the normal um, the, the, the normal criteria is because that you are uh, have a relationship, ongoing relationship with others involved in the investigation. No. That, that was a pretty emphatic no. It's, a, it's, it's, it's as clear cut as it can be. That's okay. The criteria is built around not capturing that individual. Okay, because in the life and the day of a, of a member, you know, he comes and becomes sure. involved with a bunch of folks uh, just holistically within the, right, th throughout the community. Um, if, how long has this g database been in existence? I don't want to exactly. Yeah, look, could, could I, do you, do you want to? 24 times. Yeah, I mean, I know it was revised and seriously overhauled in 14 at the beginning of this administration where it's it's a lot smaller than what it used to be, but it, it wasn't, the so prior version was around. If, if, if we go back a decade or two and look at what that universe looked like, then does it look the same as it does now? No, because I, I, think, the, I, I think the danger you know, the learning lesson was is that, and, and I, I think, look, I think realistically we, we can say the same thing about street stops, right? If you go back a decade, you had 680,000 and you took this broad approach, right? And what it, you know, versus now you have under 12,000. Okay, so, I, I, and that's I, the I asked idea. the question incorrectly. No, no, so I'm saying the, the idea is. That wasn't a question. I, I, I wasn't looking for the entire universe. I was looking for the demographics within the universe. They would look significantly different from when they look now, correct? I, I don't know to, to answer that, but I, 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 I no, I mean, I, I Chief, don't doubt around that. around a little while, you, you, you know. I don't that, think it would be different. That gangs, I don't th and, and, and I, 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 trust me. Um, I don't think it would be. No, I'm, I'm agreeing with you in the sense that if, I don't think look, it would be you significantly go back different. Ten years, um, the communities that were being impacted by gang proliferation throughout the city, if you go back 20 years, the, the impact that those gangs had on those communities, I would even submit what we see now have not even begun to touch the surface of what we've seen then. I am, the questioning is, best practice, why don't we see those uh, 
why aren't those gangs no longer uh, active uh, or represented here if they're not active? I don't believe that they are in the communities that were represented uh, in, in years past. What was done then to uh, eliminate that? Are we using those best practices to address that? Or are we just, I mean, are you, this is accepted. Are you talking about the gangs in general, right? How, how we're lessening them. I think you just look look at the number of homicides and shootings. We've gone from 5,200 to under, under 800. So a lot of these shootings are gang-related, so we are having a significant impact on the gangs from we had years and years ago. Um, are we seeing the same gangs that we saw 10 years ago, 15 years ago? Not, no, no. I, I know you have smaller crews and stuff crews, like that yes, now. Yes. But locations, demographics, it, it, here... Uh, clearly, 98% are, are black and Hispanic. Yeah, that that wasn't the case 10 years ago. 10 years ago. In fact, I think we can all agree that that wasn't the case, and the impact that they had it on communities certainly hasn't risen, risen to that level that it was back then. I'm merely saying that if they don't exist, that's a great thing. What was the best practices that we can then use to make sure that we're addressing that? in these communities that, that, that are being impacted now? I mean, I, I think, if I understand your question, I think I do. I, I think the, the answer is the precision policing. You know, when we focus on the small number of the crime drivers that are driving the crime, you know, they, you know, we, we make sure that you, you have, we focus our resources rather than these broad approaches that may have caught up other groups or other individuals, and we focus on the few that we know are driving our crime numbers. When you see that happening, when you see our resources focused on the locations where the crime is happening, you know, you see less crime starting to happen when that, when, when that's the result of this. And then, you know, and I, I know I mentioned this in my opening statement, which is neighborhood policing. I mean, it's going into those same neighborhoods after we've addressed, you know, specific individuals through precision policing going into that community and and with our NCO with our sector cops and actually rebuilding trust rebuilding trust you know developing that one-on-one -on -one relationship where the community knows the cop and the cop knows the community okay so so or, or clearly this predated uh, uh, community policing but I, I don't want to um, languish on that too much uh, how, how early has the department observed uh, 3D and, and ghost guns entering into the cities. When, when, yeah. when did that reach the radar, if, if at all? No, when did they start entering the city? When I just got the last three years. Yes, I mean, we, we're taking a look. What we did was we took a look at the last three years in terms mm -hmm. of numbers. We didn't go back further. The number... So I think it's important to highlight the numbers aren't really drastic in terms of recoveries of 3D guns, recovery of ghost guns. But, but that, that's actually a good thing, and, and I'll tell you why this is a good thing. You know, we're, we always seem to find ourselves reacting, right? What you're doing with this legislation is you're being proactive. What we're seeing happening on the West Coast that's going to wind up moving its way here, you're not waiting until it gets here. You're actually addressing it before it gets here. And these receivers that are untraceable, that, you know, you can basically build your own gun. Uh, you could have somebody with a level of expertise that goes on the Internet, gets instructions, buys a component part that they can buy on the Internet or buy somewhere else before you know it, they're building 200, 300, 400 guns, giving it out to some of the criminal groups that are now using untraceable weapons. What you're doing with this legislation is you're getting way ahead of the curve before it becomes an epidemic in this city. And you're basically saying, look, if you have that untraceable component part, even before you build it into a lethal weapon, we're going to make that an unclassified misdemeanor. We're going to give the police a tool to be able to seize it, to to arrest somebody for 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 having it, and that's that's a good thing. Is there a way to determine whether or not one of these uh, guns was used in a, in a shooting incident? Ballistics. Can you? Would it leave a ballistics? Yeah, it would. That would be a ballistics match. So if if one of those guns was involved in a shooting, 
we would get the, the ballistics, we send it to our lab, and if we had the ballistics and the recovered firearm. We so you need the recovered firearm. Absolutely. <laughs> so outside of that, there's no way to really determine if uh, how many, if, if you haven't recovered a firearm um, um, as a result of the incident, then there's no way to determine whether or not specifically a ghost gun 3D was used in a shooting incident. So um, to this point, um, it can't be documented. Is that accurate? To, to the point of your bill? You, no, you to, to, to this point that if, if, if all the shootings that have occurred, if you don't have an actual 3D ghost gun to match it up with, you cannot determine whether or not they were actually involved in the shooting or not. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we would need the firearm to match up to the ballistics. Have there been any seizures? Yes, uh, uh, in the last three years, mm -hmm. three years of ghost guns. In seven, 2017, we had 32 seizures. 2018, we had 14. And in 2019, 21. W now, were they multiple seizures or uh, I, just individual? I think there was a few multiples, but we could get that information how they were seized back to you. Most of them, uh, like I, my previous job was uh, uh, in gun violence where we did the uh, firearms and firearms tracking. And uh, we're seeing these guns coming from Nevada, California, pieces like that. So uh, it, it, it would be really important in our firearms investigation, our firearms traffic investigations, to stop this because we can't track the source states, we can't track who manufactured them or who sold these guns. So this is pretty important. So I, I have other questions, but it, but it seems like that, that the department is supportive. Um, so I, I'll just ask, is, do you think that um, as currently constituted, this legislation is going to be helpful? Do you see anything that could be added to this? Um, that will give you the tools and resources to, to address um, what we uh, anticipate as potential problem uh, yeah, I in think, terms of um, proliferation. Yeah, I think we're going to – we'll work together, of course, with central staff and, and on figuring out the right language because, you know, we have federal statutes, state statutes, all of that in play. So – we are supportive un unquestionably of the legislation um we're going to work together with you to make sure that it withstands uh legal requirements to make sure that it's you know we could actually use it and the statute doesn't get stricken down uh we want to have this tool have you noticed in those arrests or seizures uh a that they occurred in particular demographic, part of town, age demographic, or whatever. Where they go. It's just random. I, you know, I'll get you the number. Of, uh, we, we took, we kind of ran the totals of what we took in those three years, but let me see if I can break it down by precinct, and, you know, maybe that'll give you uh, some insight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. All righty. Back to... Um database again for a few more questions um, so you you said uh, in your testimony you stated 90 point 90 point six percent of the individuals in the database have been arrested um, how many convictions I don't have the conviction numbers on it so you'll get that back to the committee I will see if we can access that and that's those are uh, DA numbers okay so I'll, I'll see if we can uh, what we could get on that yeah and yeah and then how many individuals in a database have a felony conviction okay right so if we can get those numbers so you'll get those numbers back I'll, I'll see if we can get them I again I just qualify it by these are district attorney numbers and court administration numbers so to the extent okay. we can get it I'll, I'll do my best I'm sure you can get numbers I'll from do, the district I'll do my attorneys. You work with them, right? <laughs> I work, I, we All work right. with you, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, isn't it true that officers or detectives, so you spoke of um, self-admittance -admit of being in a gang. Um, so just run me through that. So, like, you're in an interrogation room and you're being interrogated, interrogated and you just voluntarily are like, I'm a blood, by the way. People do that? Yeah, you, you, were <laughs> look, you were surprised the last time a year ago we were before you. But as I said, look, for a lot of, for a lot of folks, we're selective about 
who's in who's in the database and I've highlighted all the criteria but for the folks that are in it there's a lot of folks that are proud members of criminal groups. That's a status symbol for them to identify and to admit, yes, this is who I am. They're posting it on their social media accounts. They're, it, that, it's not a far-fetched thing. I know you found it hard to believe a year ago. Hey, it I sounds like you find it hard to believe still, but that's, that's just the truth of the matter. But I, I would also say that perhaps in some interrogations, and maybe I'm not aware of I'm obviously not aware of what goes on in every interrogation that, you know, detectives could give lead questions, right? Like, so you are a crip, right? And I would assume that those individuals or maybe in some cases may respond, no, I'm not a crip. I could be a blood. So I guess my concern is, you know, during interrogation, what techniques are being used? Are there lead questions that would? I mean, we follow we follow the law when it comes to interrogations. I mean, that's been long established, you know, through case law. If, if we don't follow the law, the statements get suppressed. So it doesn't benefit anybody by us asking inappropriate questions that'll lead to inadmissible evidence. Right. Um, and do you believe that notifying um, teenagers could serve as a deterrent? And I'll, I'll just speak for myself. You know, if my mom got a notification I was in a gang, I probably would be more scared of my mom than you. Um, <laughs> but do you think this could serve as a, as a deterrent um, in some cases? And then, you know, we spoke of direct outreach, in, and if there's no plan, that's okay. I think that's the point of the, having this hearing. Um, you know, could there be, if you have 496 individuals in the state, 494 in a database, you know, you have cure violence groups, mm -hmm. could we do a better job at connecting the cure violence groups with these teenagers or people who are not even teenagers who may be in a database? Um, not notifying them, but technically is there a way still to go around that and ensure that perhaps their information gets to a crisis management system through some of the local precincts or whatever um, to ensure that they're being connected to services, which then can ensure that we're putting these young people on a path of success? Yeah, I mean, I think, and I said this in the testimony in the prepared statement, and I'll say it to you as well. I. To the extent that it does not jeopardize an investigation, you're not going to see us opposed to getting kids back on the right track. We, a lot of our programs are aimed at getting them on the right track before they get on the wrong track. Some of them are aimed at getting them on the right track even if they took the wrong track. Um, so I just... I think the issue here is sending out notifications and alerting individuals, uh, whether they be third parties or otherwise, uh, that somebody is in a, an investigative lead. I'm not saying you have no, to. No, I know, that. I know. Right. I, but I'm. Mm -hmm. But I, when you talk about the universe of programs that are out there, I think we're open to programs to the extent that they don't compromise investigation. Right, and I think you have youth officers in most precincts, mm -hmm. right? So. Perhaps strategically working with the youth officer to say, hey, uh, John Doe at Andrew Jackson is in this gang. Um, perhaps, you know, mention it. I don't know if there could be coordination with, say, a guidance counselor, a social worker, or, you know, some of the crisis management organizations to flag those names to say, hey, you may want to have a conversation with these individuals about services and other things. I want to move from that and just lastly ask, I have just a few more questions, one more on this. Um, you know, there have been calls to um, eliminate the gang database. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to know is couldn't you do investigations without a database? I mean, what, if we were to eliminate this thing, would this preclude you from being able to still have investigations and still carry on the work um, that you're doing now, minus having a database? I, but, you know, it's, you, when you... And there are the cities that well, have the, eliminated the, it. Right, but right? There, there's, the idea is why, why would you not take advantage of technology that's out there that could help you more precisely target the individuals that are driving your crime, that are enabling you to connect the dots to see who's responsible for crime, enabling you to connect the dots to see who can possibly be the recipient because this gang shot at this gang, so now we know there's going to be retribution. 
to, to make that more difficult, to create, to set up index cards, you know, would be the equivalent of let's not use a cell phone and let's yell across the courtyard at each other through our windows and communicate that way. Why would you do that? You know, there, there's a more efficient way to leverage technology to more effectively drive down crime and we've done that and I and you know I know that that you're you're supportive of that when we see arrests down 140,000 from five years ago in a given year when we see some see criminal court summonses down in the high 70 78 percent street stops from 680,000 to under 12,000 the jail population below 9,000 I mean these are all things that are not done by accident we're focusing on the drivers of crime but in order to focus on them effectively we need to leverage the technology that's out there now. It, it, it just makes no sense to have us use antiquated techniques or to hamstring the police department and leave dangerous folks out there for any longer than they need to be out there to victimize somebody else. Have we seen increases in crimes in crime where we've where they've eliminated the database? I you haven't studied with uh, other cities. I mean, I haven't studied. Uh, you know cities that eliminated the database, but realistically, you know, those city, every city is unique. Every city has their unique needs. I mean, we have our needs as the most densely populated city in the country. You know, we have millions of people in a relatively small area. We need to keep everybody safe, and we are not, we're not supportive of eliminating the necessary tools to do that. Right. And I think you, uh, technology would be there whether you had a database or not, but I think the concern is um, that there could be innocent people labeled in this database. And although I'm, you know, I'm hearing you, you're saying that other individuals don't have access to this database, um, I, I want to believe you. But there's I want this historical, <laughs> you know, relationship that, for instance, you know, DOI releases a report yesterday on biased crimes. And in that report, you know, we you have not substantiated one um, not biased crime, but uh, biased labeling um, by police officers of individuals. You have not substantiated one um, biased complaint ever. <laughs> um, so I want to work with you, but it just becomes hard to believe that there are not innocent people entangled in this database who should not be in there uh, and be labeled gang members. And then not only that, I still, my opinion is that um, you could still do the work that you're doing without having a database and still be successful. I don't see how that minimizes um, your investig investigatory tools to yeah, actually that's, uh, work on you know, individuals who may be associated or may not be associated, but I think our concern is that there may be teenagers, there may be individuals who are labeled as gang members, which does, in a, <laughs> although you're saying it doesn't, you know, I don't want to say you're not saying it matters, um, but they're well, going to have this matters. stigma and on the streets. It certainly matters, yeah. but what it doesn't do is have the collateral consequences that you see in other states. You're not getting penalty enhancements or sentence enhancements. You're not being criminalized for solely being in the database. You're not being stopped in the street because you're in the database solely for that reason. You're not, um, you're not, your ability to get an apartment, your ability to enter school, nobody is informed of this. It is a law enforcement tool that we use to address criminal activity by criminal groups. Okay, I'm gonna move from that. I have a difference of opinion, but we won't resolve it in right now. Um, let's go to stage perp walks for a second. Does the department have a policy around notifying the media when suspects are being transported from precinct to uh, central booking? No, so the, depart the department complies with, and there was a case law, I believe, in the early 2000s, uh, a federal case that spoke directly to staged perp walks, and that's not something that we do. Our, our problem, I guess our concern with the bill as written, is that it would actually hamstring our ability to do routine work. Now, of course, I, I know what the follow-up question is going to be. We have a carve-out for you to routinely transport uh, individuals outside of precincts. But, you know, the it's 
staging a uh, uh, let's I'll use the terminology staging the perp walk is is really an, an amorphous term right so if we have for example you know our hearings on uh, sex crimes in a unit and sex crimes investigations one of the things that was raised one of the recommendations of DOI's report and something that council member Rosenthal has and yourself have 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 held our feet to the fire on is to get the uh, sex crimes facilities uh, as recommended up and running. Well, the recommendation is to have separate entrances for victims and separate entrances for perpetrators. So by default, what we're having is in a high profile sex crime, um, the media would know that the individual, the perpetrator is gonna be coming in and out of a particular doorway there could be a gaggle of media there, a lot of cameras there. We need to set them off on the side to be able to use the door. So if we put a barricade there, are we now walking out a perpetrator or bringing them into a facility? We staged arguably media by clearing a doorway, by telling them, stand on this side. Are we staging a perp walk? It opens up police officers and detectives to the potential of violating the local law for simply doing their job. Now, in terms of, you know, and there's other facilities that are older facilities that really only have, uh, I mentioned sex crimes, but they only have one, mean, one means of ingress and egress. So you'll have the same situation happening there. But no, the, we don't stage uh, the movement of a prisoner for the media, uh, but passing a law that would effectively, I, I guess, prohibit that would place officers in a situation where they could potentially be violating the law by simply doing their job. I think what we're getting at is just ensuring that, you know, innocent to proven guilty Sure, you know, but that's what that's what and the I think case the perception, said. unfortunately. I mean, I just go back to um, the innocent five, how they were walked and paraded out of this precinct, right? Um, innocently, and unfortunately, they were guilty before they even got a fair shake. Um, you know, um, you know, in the public eyes, because and I, you know, because of the media, technically as well. Um, so you're saying you don't call media at all? Sorry. Uh, are you cooling off? Is it getting little, too hot in here for you now? I'm talking a little all too right. much. Right. <laughs> um, so NYPD has a policy or is there no policy on calling the media? I mean, I don't, I'm not aware of a written policy, but after we're done with the hearing, I'll call DCPI and see if they have something in writing that okay. I can share with you. And does staging... a uh, yeah. The media taking photos of a suspect in handcuffs serve any law enforcement or investigatory purpose? It doesn't serve a, a law enforcement or investigatory purpose that I can think of. But I mean, I think, could I, can you repeat the question one time? I'll, get, I'll make it easy. Okay. Do you support a bill that would say you can't call the media? Would I support the bill? Support a bill that says you cannot call the media. I mean, I, I think you need to balance what, what you're saying with the fact that we routinely call the media when we have a wanted out, outstanding suspect that we, through our partners in the media, we alert the, uh, we alert the public um, that this person is wanted. They put out through, uh, whether it's New York One or, or any of the other media outlets, they Put out. They're kind enough to put out, and that's fine. I'm not. I'm not getting at that. But I, I mean, that's what, stem, what ultimately stems from that right. is is when you actually take this dangerous criminal off the street. Alleged. I mean, alleged, alleged. dangerous criminal right. off the street. Mm -hmm. um, the public already saw the wanted poster. They know this person is wanted. Uh, the media provides them with some sort of closure. So, is there going to be a question about has there been an apprehension made? Are we now then not going to be allowed to close the loop? They've put out the wanted poster. They want to know. No, but I think you can so. still put a statement out. That's fine. That you know this individual. So, I mean, in custody, look, I'll, I'll just, take a look at the bill if it's written, and I'll make an assessment there. I just wouldn't want to speculate. All righty. Um, just on internet purchase exchange locations, do you ever receive complaints of robberies or other crimes that arise from trans transactions that people negotiate online using sites like Craigslist? And um, what states? Well, what steps do the department take to make those transactions safer? So, 
We ran some numbers, uh, and I, I don't. I know you mentioned a particular website. This is not. I'm, I'm, these numbers are not Craigslist married. Craigslist an example. Yeah, but it's not married to crimes that happened as a result of purchases on that website. This is overall reported uh, robberies, is it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, just for the last three years, the social media exchanged uh, robberies. 2017, we had 203. 2018, 213. And year-to-date, 2019, 81. Uh, Equivalent about 2017, it's about 1.4 percent of our robberies. 18, about 1.6 percent, and this year, 1.4 percent of our robberies are the social media type. And are there any things? Uh, can you just speak to any initiatives or things you're doing just to keep these transactions as safe as possible? I don't expect for you to be able to resolve all of them, but. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Uh, the investigation into the social media are, are handled by our robbery squads, where it's our experts on robberies. They're not hold, uh, held by the, the local squads. This, they have more of an expertise at robbery investigations, going into social media, subpoenaing, getting websites, mm -hmm. speaking to people. So every one of our social media um, robberies is handled by our robbery squad, not the local squad. And they also look to see if there's any connections, any patterns, anything going on citywide. All righty, awesome. All righty, I think that is it for me. Okay, awesome. So we're going to let you go. Let me just ask on the um, air dropping. Um, what role do private companies like Apple play during investigations? Is there more that you think they should be doing um, around the airdrop options? Yeah. Are they responsive to concerns? Are they cooperative? Yeah, yeah. When, when we subpoena Apple and most of your social media companies, they're very uh, receptive as long as we have uh, the proper support. And records. when um, someone airdrops a photo, um, does the sender's phone leave any kind of digital footprint that can be tracked? You know? Let, let, let me let me look into it. I just uh, I don't want to say Yeah, I don't want to say something that. And have you bad. given any suggestions to Apple? on this at all? Has there been any conversation, not just Apple, but any of these companies that have these sort of airdrop options? I mean, we have, we, we do have partnership. I know there are, there are certain issues that clearly, you know, right. we don't, we, we wouldn't agree on, but there's right. other, we routinely partner with technology companies on solving crimes. I'll find out mm -hmm. right. for you uh, if there has been any conversation about, you know, whether them updating their software to make, mm -hmm. To, you know, to put safeguards in place or whether there are unique identifiers in an airdrop. One friendly suggestion could just be make sure the person's cell phone number shows up when you airdrop the photo. So that may be, that's going to be something we recommend to them. Um, but it would be helpful from a law enforcement standpoint if you did that as well. I think that would resolve a lot of issues if sure. people knew that their phone numbers would directly show up after they dropping the photo. Sure. All right, I want to thank you. We have a lot more work to do um, to ensure that we have a just, oh, you have a question? No. Oh, okay, a, a, a more just city. Um, you got my points on the gang database. I still think we have a lot of work to do um, to ensure that we're not entrapping, especially young people who we should really ensure have the services to pull them out of gangs. Um, we still have a lot more work. We see this as the beginning of the conversation on the database. We look forward to working with you further on it. Um, keep driving those numbers down. Thank you. Thank you. Panel, Marie Deleuze, Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. Natalie Arzu, Moms Demand Action. Liliana Zaragoza, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Center for Constitutional Rights, Bronx Defenders. And Fauzik Sadiqwa, 
gen girls for gender equity. And we're going to put three minutes on the clock for each person. Uh, thank you. I'm going to let uh, Councilmember Rosenthal is going to read a statement first, and then we're going to go to each panel. Each panelist will have three minutes for the, to read their testimony. Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Richards. Thank you for holding this important hearing. I appreciate hearing from the NYPD, and I really appreciate Moms Demand Action um, because of you and because of your constant vigilance. Um, we make changes and that's true f for moms so shout out um, I'm pleased that my legislation intro 1553 which prohibits the possession of an unfinished frame or receiver of a firearm is being heard today 36,383 people die each year from gun violence another 100 or 120 are injured and while sorry 36,380 people die each year from gun violence another hundred thousand 120 are injured while New York City stands out for its common-sense gun laws and declining homicide rate a critical loophole in gun safety has emerged in the form of untraceable firearms, also known as ghost guns. One common method of creating a ghost gun is through purchasing an unfinished receiver, which is essentially 80% of a gun. From there, all it takes is a quick trip to the local hardware store or a one minute Google search to find what you need to complete the firearm. These guns have no serial numbers, making them especially popular among individuals who are unable to purchase guns legally. This makes them virtually untraceable by law enforcement and allows criminals to bypass background checks and licensing laws. My legislation will make it illegal to per possess or to dispose of an unfinished frame or receiver in New York City. Violators will be charged with a misdemeanor punishable by a maximum fine of $1,000 or imprisonment for a year or both. I really want to thank, um, sorry, uh, before I say that, California and New Jersey are currently the only states that regulate these weapons. New York City has the opportunity to be at the forefront of this issue and set an important precedent that other cities and states uh, should allow. I'm proud to sponsor the legislation around, uh, along with Councilmember Miller, Chair Richards, and the public advocate. And I'm very honored to have the support of every town for gun safety and moms demand action. And I am um, pleased that the NYPD supports this legislation and look forward to swiftly passing the law. And I look forward to hearing from you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, you may begin. State your name for the record and your organization you belong to. Um, my name is Natalie. Your uh, mic, every button. There you go. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, my name is Natalie Arzu. I'm representing Moms Demand Action. Like previously said, um, there is a decrease in gun violence, but people are still dying in our streets. One life is too many. Many can agree that there are a lot of unregistered and illegal guns in our community, basically in black and brown communities. Having unregistered ghost guns and being able to make it your own at home will only exacerbate the issue in our communities. This is just another threat in our community. I personally know how illegal and unregistered guns can impact our lives. 
On September 15, 2011, my brother was walking his girlfriend home where he was shot by two men by two illegal guns. He was shot 15 times. He did not survive. There are many children that die in our streets every day because of illegal and unregistered guns. We should not have any more lives because there are ghost guns. We should take preventative action. We should not wait until many more lives and many more funerals where we say we have to do more. We have to do more now. Prevent it before it actually happens to someone you love, your friends, and even in your community. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. My name is Marie Deleuze, and I always like to start with an introduction. This is my nephew, Pierre Paul Jean-Paul Jr. He was actually uh, killed on November 11, 2008. He was killed in um, Cran Cambria Heights, Queens. They actually found 10 bullets in the scene, so he was shot at 10 times, and seven of the bullets actually impacted his body. The one that killed him was the one that hit his heart. And he was also walking with a young lady that he just saw that he particularly liked. And then they were just going into the McDonald's on the corner of Springfield when the perpetrator approached him from behind and shot him. My family, uh, I guess we're fortunate enough to get, uh, we get what we call justice because the perpetrator was actually caught. But the perpetrator was caught because of eyewitness. They didn't find the gun that the perpetrator had. And if they find the gun, at least, whether it have serial numbers or not, at least we would be able to identify the gun if it impacts other people, right? If it shoots other people, we could the, the gun would have a body. By having ghost guns without serial number untraceable, that is going to be nearly impossible. I should also note that I'm a former Marine, even though I'm not a combat vet, but I am a former Marine of Desert Storm, and I'm also a sharpshooter. So I know how to mantle and dismantle weapons. I've seen these um, guns. They could print out every, almost every component except for the pins on these guns. They could get the actual um, hardware from anywhere to build it. 80% of the guns could be built by the ghost guns. I as a survivor, a fellow survivor, and Natalie's is a fellow survivor, and I also want to say thank you very much for actually bringing these bills. And I want to thank Moms of Man Action for being here, but as a fellow survivor, I want to say that these guns are going to make it more difficult for officers to catch our killers, our killers, our family killers. And I definitely would love to endorse um, Intro 1553 and Intro 1548 to make it safer for us in New York City because they will come. I know that they've, they they talked about, the NYPD talked about, they already captured um, 27, in 2017, 32 ghost guns already here in New York in 2018 14 some people will say okay 32 to 14 is um is a decline but then in 2019 we already have 21 it already started you know we really need to do something I do not want anyone else to lose family members to gun violence and by having these ghost guns these untraceable guns is going to make it more and more difficult to capture the perpetrator I was lucky Natalie was your um what did they find um the killer of your brother um, only one was caught because he, it was basically people said it was him, but there was another person that still wasn't caught yet. And a lot of our survivors have the same problem. We have a lot of survivors in our group who have not been able to call the perpetrator. It will make it a lot more difficult to catch our perpetrator, the perpetrator, perpetrators that kill our families with these guns. Thank you. Thank you. And I share a common story with you. My uh, childhood best friend was also murdered. You know, unfortunately, they never found his killer either. We know who it is. Everybody knows who it is, but no justice. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you, Chairperson um, Richards and Council Members. I'm actually here today to talk about Intro 2223 on behalf of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the Bronx Defenders, and the Center for Constitutional Rights. And I'm particularly humbled to be here, actually, next to Mom's Demand Action. Um, and, you know, it's a coincidence since, since I'm not commenting on that bill, but um, the answer to tragedy in black and brown communities is not over-policing and perpetuating pernicious stereotypes of black and brown communities and youth. 
Um, as Donovan Richards, uh, as to the chairperson, spoke about earlier today, we were here nearly a year ago, and we talked about these same dangers, and and not much has changed. In fact, the gang database has actually has actually grown. Um, in the NYPD, we heard them earlier today talk about how there are no collateral consequences to this, but we know that now it's about 98, almost 99 percent um, black and brown. It remains that way, and. The fact that there exists, that there is an almost exclusively black and brown list, this inherently tells people, it, it perpetuates the stereotype both within the NYPD and our community at large that black and brown youth, but also emerging adults, also equally a 25 year old parent, a 45 year old uncle or father, father figure, is a criminal, a gang member, or potentially a thug. And although the NYPD earlier said that there are no collateral consequences, this database actually exposes people to increased surveillance and scrutiny. And even though the NYPD testified earlier that they may not be stopping people because they are simply on the list, people are almost certainly targeted because of it or on high alert for these particular individuals. So today, although I we take no explicit position on the, on the bill introduced today, we do think that it is a modest first step. We appreciate the bravery of addressing this issue. But we think that it's not only the monitoring of minors that is deeply troubling. It is the racial imbalance, the race profiling that is equally troubling. And the vagueness and overbroad contours of the criteria that the NYPD talked about earlier today, you know, repeatedly they assured us that uh, Chairperson Richards, you would not be on the list. But last year you were told that you would be if you simply wore red colors and you were by a bodega. And earlier today they talked about self-admission. That is certainly a possibility. You know, we'll just accept that as true. But the, the reality is that individuals on social media may be taking pictures with their neighbors. They may be taking pictures with uh, individuals. They may be sitting on their stoop. And it may not simply be that walk to the bus that we talked about earlier, but you cannot help if your brother is in a gang. What if, you know, you not, cannot help the company that you keep. And the criteria criminalizes innocent behavior, and it is unchecked. So under this bill, we do have a concern that even for the about 8% of individuals, or perhaps 2% now, um, even for them, the NYPD ultimately has the sole discretion about whether to provide notice, about whether the exception for an active investigation should apply without any additional oversight. <coughs> and in addition, it provides no process or right for appeal. We think that some of these elements are, in, are incredibly important, and we think that the racially disproportionate impact and the, the complete discretion run amok for the NYPD without check is a problem, and for that we would love to have a further conversation about what needs to be done in the future. Thank you for your testimony. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, Chair Richards and Council Members. My name is Fazia Siddiqui, and I'm a legal intern for Girls for Gender Equity. Um, thank you for holding this important public safety hearing and giving me the opportunity to speak today. Chair R Richards, um, I would like to thank you especially for your proposed bill demanding NYPD transparency with respect to the so-called criminal groups database. Thank you for doing the work to help us move towards a safer and more accountable New York City. At GGE, we share a common goal with your initiative to protect young people from unethical and often unconstitutional race-based policing. GGE is a youth development and advocacy organization based in New York City, committed to the psychological, physical, social, and economic development of girls and women. GGE challenges structural forces, including racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, and economic inequity, which constricts the freedom, full expression, and rights of transgender and cisgender girls and women of color. We are offering testimony today to highlight the intersections between the NYPD's gang policing strategy, school policing, and the so-called school to prison pipeline. This framing is helpful but does not fully capture the experiences of girls and non-binary youth of color. We instead use the term push out, coined by scholar Dr. Monique Morris to characterize the ways that girls and non-binary youth end up leaving school before graduation. When our young people are arbitrarily added to the NYPD's surreptitious gang database, 
they are preemptively fast-tracked into entering the juvenile or criminal legal systems. The gang database is yet another system put in place to incarcerate young people for nonviolent crimes under the guise of gang membership. Gang association by itself is not a crime in New York, but inclusion in the database is a well-known police tactic used to bolster a misdemeanor charge into a felony. Chair Richards' proposed bill to create an appeals process is a crucial first step towards NYPD accountability, but I urge council members to push legislation even further by challenging the criteria that the NYPD uses for gang membership identification in the first place. The process for designating young people as a so-called identified gang member relies on information from school safety agents and un unidentified outside agency sources who provide little to no substan substantive proof of actual gang membership. A hunch based on clothing colors, tattoos, scars, and tangential associations with known gang members should never be enough to condemn a young person to a lifetime of NYPD surveillance. Last week, the Department of Education and the, and the NYPD released a new memorandum of understanding to address the problematic presence of school safety agents in public schools. Per the MOU, NYPD, NYPD personnel are not permitted to interfere with non-criminal misconduct in schools, such as uniform violations, low-level marijuana possession, or disorderly conduct. This is a huge win for GGE's work towards significantly reducing NYPD presence in schools, and a firm step in reducing push out for girls and women of color. color. <clears throat> um, so in short, I implore the city council to take the MOU's momentum in stride and work towards further transparency in NYPD surveillance and database building. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. And uh, can you just speak to just a few more um, sure. uh, recommendations you had um, on the database, on this bill? Sure. Um, so for example, let me actually turn to the the particular flaws. Is that is that what you'd like yeah, to hear about? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, so, you know, we really think that Obviously, it's deeply troubling that that minors um, are on this database. But as we learned today, you know, even introducing this bill may, may do little if the NYPD is already starting to kind of cull their list and remove minors. Um, it is no less troubling, right, that there are other individuals um, who equally, you know, will, will not be given any notice. Um, and, you know, ironically, I, th I think it's interesting that the NYPD earlier today talks about the danger of notice, but, you know, outside of you know, certain investigative tools that they may be worried about. If people are being chilled from engaging in criminal activity because they know that they're being surveilled, you know, what, what, is, what is the problem? Isn't that exactly their mm -hmm. goal? Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of, of having this process be more transparent for everyone, I think that it, that can only be of interest f for everyone and it would ensure that, that if they do indeed want this list to be you know, a few hundred people, people who they, they talked about, I think it was in the hundreds of people who have committed homicides, for example. Um, you know, if, if that's the goal, that is, this database is not is not um, working toward that end. Um, you know, although I find the, the database to be inherently problematic, um, even for the minors that, um, that this bill is intended um, to benefit, um, the notice requirement, so the exception for active criminal investigations, um, in the context of, of gang policing and enforcement, um, you know, this is really characterized by, you know, the mass raids that, that earlier today we were talking about, or the NYPD was talking about as being incredibly effective. I'm not sure if that is actually the case, um, particularly in, li in light of, I know Professor Howell, who will be speaking later today, issued the Bronx 120 report in in April, and in fact, there there's no requirement that any crime be committed at all. And within the the mass RICO indictments that um, you know have been coming down after, for example, the Bronx 120, um, many individuals you know allocated to to very low level um, conduct, perhaps selling marijuana, right? And so, in terms of the sweep for the potential, you know, the potential for the NYPD to say, no, we won't give notice even to minors because there's an active criminal investigation. You know, is there an investigation six degrees of separation from that particular minor, right? What, is, what does that mean? When will the exception apply? It could swallow the rule of notice in the first place. And then, um, you know, even if there is notice, um, there, th that is completely within the discretion of the NYPD 
to, to um, you know, once, once that notice is given, the burden is also on the child and the family potentially to contest this designation. It's unclear, um, you know, from the bill and from, from how the NYPD is operating the secretive gang database, whether, you know, what level of information the family would be given. There's an informational asymmetry, right, where they wouldn't necessarily even be able to contest it, even if uh, the individual is not in the database. Um, finally, uh, I discussed a little bit earlier about how there's no, you know, listed process to appeal. There's no oversight, right? Over in inherently now in the gang database, there's no oversight over the initial designation. Under this bill, there's also no oversight over the NYPD's internal. Um, kind of review of whether notice should be given or whether the designation was erroneous. Um, so I think that that is one one big issue, right? The transparency and transparency and reporting. Um, so we we do appreciate that. Um, you know, I think it's subsection D of the bill, which talks about reporting every year to the city council and then providing certain information online. Um, but the reality is that, that this is really functioning as a black box in so many ways um, that even, you know, providing a little bit of due process um, may be a hollow victory because it, it just simply might not be feasible to attack something that you don't know enough about. And I think that's the purpose of right, at least right. getting it. Right. It's not been easy to get here, <laughs> um, but at least starting to move it into the direction. I mean, right. at the end of the day, I would love to see it abolished, period. And we agree. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but, you know, we're going to take these steps to at least ensure that there's more transparency as of now, because right, right now, you know, we're just starting to get data around it, right? I mean, you've been doing the work around it. Um, and I commend all the advocates. So we look forward to working with you further to keep chipping away at this. Um, thank you for the work you've done. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. Next panel, Albert Kahn, Surveillance Tech Oversight Project. Vital Gorman, Just USA. I think that's right. All right. Young Me, Young Me Lee, Brooklyn Defender Services. Alex Vitale, Policing and Social Justice Project, Brooklyn College. Alex? Vitale. Vitale, Vitale, Alex Vitale. Oh, there you go. Yep. Come on down. All right. Was that four? Okay, cool. Come on down, Alex. All right, you may begin, Albert. Good afternoon. My name is Albert Kahn, and I'm the executive director and founder of the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project at the Urban Justice Center. We're a nonprofit advocacy group that fights for New Yorkers' civil rights and privacy. And we really commend um, Chair Richards and the committee for taking these important steps to protect New York's privacy, uh, both through the reform of the uh, gang database and uh, through the measures to reform uh, so-called perp locks which allow the NYPD to really have tremendous power to coerce criminal suspects who have not been indicted for, let alone convicted of, any crime. Uh, I, my remarks are going to be a shorter excerpt of the longer statement I've submitted to the record. And with the gang database, I, from our perspective as a privacy organization, we see the current gang database as nothing less than the continuation of stop and frisk. It is digital stop and frisk. It is a systematic effort to try to over-police communities of color that have endured this sort of mistreatment by law enforcement, not for years, but for decades. And the measures we ha see the committee uh, reviewing today are important. They're a crucial first step, but like my colleagues from the civil rights community, we believe that they are only a first step, that further reforms must include protections for the adults who are wrongly included in the database. You do not age out of core constitutional rights. You do not age out of the need for due process. And the adults who are wrongly labeled as being affiliated with gangs simply because of where they live or because of the color of their skin or the clothes that they're wearing, those individuals, those New Yorkers deserve the right to have their names cleared. 
And at this moment where we see the Trump administration attacking commun uh, immigrant communities, using information often from local and state agencies, the need to end this database, or at the very least, expand protections to all New Yorkers is quite crucial. With regards to perp walks, we view it as completely unconstitutional to have a process by which police officers are able to tarnish the reputation of New Yorkers who have not had their day in court. People deserve trial in a court of law, not trial by the court of public opinion. And we believe it is essential to end this practice, which we know has been used to attack, some cases irre irreparably, the reputations of so many New Yorkers arrested for crimes they never committed. This practice has no place in our city, and it must end. And these measures are crucial, but they deal with specific silos of privacy concerns. And we at STOP believe that systemic privacy reforms are needed. And that's why we'd also like to bring the committee's attention to the POST Act, a bill we've been championing since we were founded, a bill that would provide systemic privacy reforms against NYPD data collection and surveillance, a bill that would be one of the weakest police oversight bills on surveillance in the country, and long overdue. But as with uh, the gang database reforms, it would be an indispensable first step. And in a moment when progressive cities across the country, like Oakland and San Francisco, are taking radical steps, progressive steps of banning facial recognition, banning some of these technologies, the POST Act is indispensable because while it doesn't ban a single tool, while it doesn't stop the NYPD from conducting surveillance, it creates due process, it creates standards, it creates privacy protections, and it creates the framework to have further reforms. Because as the gang database has shown us, when we allow these tools to operate without oversight, without regulation, and without redress, the pattern of discrimination is quite clear. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Young Mi Lee. I'm a supervising attorney at Brooklyn Defender Services. Um, I, I want to thank you um, for inviting BDS to give testimony. Um, today I'd like to focus my comments on 2223 um, in relation to gang database notifications. Uh, my written testimony goes into greater detail on this and other legislation that's under consideration today. BDS urges the council not to advance this legislation and instead to meet with advocates and experts who have been working to address so-called gang enforcement in our city. Collectively, we have urged the city to abolish the gang database or criminal group database. At a previous hearing, BDS testified before this committee and we call for an end to profile-based policing and a reallocation of resources towards supporting rather than profiling marginalized communities. This bill, which appears to be well-intended, would entrench gang designations as legitimate and would create an extremely limited and possibly ineffectual process for a subgroup of New Yorkers to determine whether they have been included in this database and only then petition to the NYPD to be removed, subject to the complete discretion of the department, which originally included them. Specifically, the bill directs the NYPD to notify, to notify only those 17 and under if they have been entered into the gang database, inexplicably leaving out New Yorkers in other age groups, and offers the department two broad exceptions that may completely swallow the new rule. It creates a very limited mechanism to contest the gang label, but only for those in this age group who have already received notice from the NYPD and gives the department full discretion to reject the petition with no due process or standards. In short, the bill allows NYPD to police itself with no other oversight. The mechanism of relief is more limited than existing Article 78 challenges, which New Yorkers of any age may pursue. The significant challenges of filing and winning in Article 78 are not improved upon in this legislation. Lastly, this legislation would establish in law an extremely broad definition of a gang. It would define gangs as formal or informal groups of three or more people who commit a crime and, for example, follow the same clothing trends. Given the expansiveness of our criminal legal system, this definition would include nearly anyone, but we know that predominantly black and Latinx people would be targeted, particularly if this definition is later used in sentencing enhancement, sentencing enhancement legislation or additions to the penal law. 
Uh, we all know that uh, almost 99 percent, based on prior testimony, of those in the gang database are black or brown. This legislation would also require annual reporting of this data, yet important questions would, re would remain, inclu including how does one get entered into the database and how does one get out? Do federal agencies, including ICE, have access to this database? Uh, there was testimony from NYPD earlier today stating that they do, they do not share this information with law enforcement, uh, with prosecutors, ICE, federal agencies. However, as a practicing criminal defense attorney, I have seen this information being shared. It's in the police reports. Um, and if you are arrested, and it appears that more than 90% of these people in the database have been arrested, it's clearly shared with, um, with um, the prosecutors. It's in there. The prosecutors use it against our clients. I've also seen it um, being used against complaining witnesses because they are sometimes also in the database, and that works against them. Um, gang databases engender mass surveillance, extremely harsh treatment in the criminal legal system, and ultimately increased marginal marginalization, which do not improve public safety. I was going to talk about the Bronx 120 report, but I just heard that Babe Howell will be testifying, so I will leave uh, that portion to her. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Alex Vitale. I'm a professor of sociology. I teach in the sociology and Africana studies department at Brooklyn College, where I coordinate the policing and social justice project as well. And we've played a coordinating role on the work on trying to investigate and critique gang policing in New York City. And we've been doing that work for the past three and a half years. Uh, I've been a working on policing issues for the last 30 years in a variety of capacities uh, domestically and internationally. Um, last year, we gathered before this committee to send a strong message that the NYPD's use of a gang database is deeply problematically problematic and needlessly harms those placed on it while undermining the long-term health and safety of communities. The NYPD has yet to provide a clear and comprehensive explanation of who is on this database, why they were placed there, and what purpose the database serves, despite the testimony today, I would argue. Despite this lack of transparency, we have learned many disturbing things about the database that others have chronicled and will continue to chronicle during this hearing, so I will skip my list for now. The bill before you today fails to adequately address any of these problems. While it calls for the possibility of notification involving juveniles, which we are told now make up less than 2% of the database, it leaves the decision about that at the discretion of the NYPD, which has made it clear that they view everyone on the database as there for investigatory reasons and therefore would be eligible for the exclusions that you have put in the language of the bill, thus making it moot. I appreciate the desire of the committee members and staff to address some of our concerns, but this bill does not do that, and therefore I cannot support it. A much more comprehensive approach to the database is needed that, include, that could include eliminating its use and existence altogether. Several jurisdictions around the country have ended the use of such databases or significantly restricted their role and provided much greater due process protections than are contained in this bill. Before such a comprehensive bill could be produced, however, we need to, a great deal of additional information about the nature of this. We have spent the last two years urging the Office of the Inspector General of the NYPD to undertake such an investigation, and it's my hope that one is underway. Similar investigations in other cities have uncovered wildly inaccurate information, racial bias in the formation of the database, and abusive and illegal practices based on the information in the database. And I've provided references to a number of such reports uh, of abusive gang database of practices. Therefore, I urge the committee to withdraw this bill and upon the completion of the OIG investigation, to meet with advocates working on this issue to develop both a comprehensive response to the database that builds on best practices nationally and an overall reevaluation of how the city of New York responds to the very real problems of youth violence in our communities. We need additional investment in non-punitive community-based interventions such as cure violence initiatives, family supports, housing stability, 
and high quality health services, including trauma counseling, not more criminalization of young people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Chairman uh, Richard, a member of the New York City uh, Council on Public Safety. My name is Vidal Guzman. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm here today to express uh, I'm totally against this bill, um, T2018-22223. Uh, based on my life experience as a former gang member, I was a member of the Bloods. Um, I live in a neighborhood that's Bloods, Crips, Latin Kings, and Three Italios. There is not a safety problem. Everybody, I got people on my block, everyone on my block jobs, so everyone's working. Um, I'm a native New Yorker from Harlem, now community organized for Just Leadership USA. Been working with the Close Rikers Island campaign since it first started. A lot of my friends been caught up in the gang database and the gang raids, friends that I grew up uh, that I got 20 years at just 16 years, uh, just at 16 years old. I was incarcerated with them. I know that they feel that society gave up on them. I never met a so-called criminal. I only met human beings that society gave up on them before they can expect, uh, expand, expand their full potential. The gang database uh, is a stop, stop and first 2.0. is a sign that the city have given up. Um, but our community can't give up. We understand young people need resources, especially in a crucial teen and young adults, um, knowing that their brain doesn't fully develop to 25. Um, when a white kid with resources get in trouble, they're, be they're bailed out and access to therapy. When a black and Latinx kid get in trouble, we're put in the school to prison pipeline. Um, that's now including the database. I understand the intention of this bill to limit harm and build transparency and, and accountability, but what this lacks, uh, the impact that we need, we need, we are encouraging that you, if you want to do something, uh, we ask you that you listen to people that have been the most harmed on the war on gangs, that have been targeting dehumanizing uh, young people that's black and brown, um, impacted communities and human rights advocates and defense organization. Uh, we, we are saying to eliminate and uh, abolish the gang database. Um, this will allow the NYPD to continue to undermine the safety of our communities. Um, to begin with, only kids 18 years old and younger that are informed that they're in the database. It's unfair to all people that are in the gang database. Uh, they have the power to deny notification for anyone who is in the gang database. One thing that I haven't seen is a major question is about how many people are in that gang database that have jobs, right? Um, how many people are in there that lost family uh, or, or, or have family that's incarcerated? A more deeper root ask questions about that. Um, and I want to argue uh, about the NYPD, uh, how they operate and their community policing. Uh, if the community policing is actually stopping in front of a parking in front of a neighborhood, then that is not community policing. Um, and I also want to put this up in the air. This is a built community platform that Just Leadership also with 50 organizations that went to all five communities uh, and asked all five communities what does safety look like? Uh, what does a healthy community look like? Um, we also, because I work on the Close Rikers Island campaign, we know it's going to be $540 million left over. We asked something really major. We had people who was gang-related, former gang members, people from the community, organizations, ask some real serious questions to people in the community. What does it look like to have more investments in the community? As a person who really been impacted by, uh, you know, not by the gang database, but what they used to have, the gang book. There has a real attention for us as in New York City to be bold and create what it exactly it means to be safety, a safe community. And a safe community doesn't mean having a, a police, uh, you know, criminalize or watch over us. What it really looks like, and this is a 30 page paper, it's more investments in our community. And this is coming from someone who is a form of blood. Um, and the last thing I really want to end, end this out as, there's a lot of Bloods and Crips and Lion Kings and Patria who are working at nonprofits right now, who are start, who started their businesses, and also are walking or going to Wall Street with suits. Um, this is, I think there's a false idea that the NYPD is saying that people are not reachable. And I think I want to uh, really challenge that because the problem becomes when we start looking at people who are black and brown or in gangs, that they, they don't need the right services that everyone else needs. The basic three pillars to be successful in life. Having food on the table, a roof over them back, and clothes on, the, uh, 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 um, on them. So I think there's a, a I, I have to say that. And I know there's a lot of people that are not here right now 
who are you know Crips and Bloods because they feel like this is not the space for them. Um, and I really want to just encourage them out there to really know that if we're serious about building our community, then we have to do it to the deep roots of what's keeping our community underfunded, over incarcerated, and over police. And last thing I want to end this at, I'm sorry, is you have an individual that's in front of you that the police talked about like I was a number, that I talk, that they talked about like I was an animal, and you have someone who is in front of you who have experience and been through the lifestyle of being blood, uh, growing up in a lifestyle where all my friends was blood, and it never just started just us being blood. It was just started from us co uh, coming back and forth to school together. And what happens, the label of gang start existing when police are criminalizing and stopping us um, and not asking us what is our basic needs as human beings to be successful. Thank you for your testimony. Encouraging story. Uh, Councilman Rosen, though, you had a question? Yeah, um, I, too, want to thank everyone here. It's really powerful testimony. Um, Ms. Lee, I just wanted to ask you specifically about the bill that I've sponsored, which um, uh, your, which Brooklyn Legal Defense's uh, Defender Services is uh, opposing, which is 1553, about the, the ghost guns. Yes. Um, I've read your testimony here, and if you could tell me more about um, the opposition, um, <clears throat> if you could tell me more, if you could explain a little better to me, I mean, I've read, um, prosecution of New Yorkers, uh, who might be unintentionally owning, um, the receivers or relics, um, is that... Is that super frequent? Is that something that's happening in communities um, that we need to be mindful of? Do you think that's happening in arenas where people are going to be vulnerable to police intrusion? Uh, I think the concern is that many different types of objects um, can be criminalized. And, and really, the focus should be more on whether it's a true weapon in the sense that it's operable. So if there's just a piece of what may be a weapon or that may be um, perhaps a component of a weapon, which could be uh, an already inoperable antique gun, then that can be criminalized. Um, so there's a, there's a concern that it's overbroad um, and we would urge the council to focus on um, also the intent. There should be the unlawful intent to make a weapon that can cause physical injury or, or obviously death, um, but also on whether it's a real weapon and whether it is in fact operable at that moment where it can then cause that physical injury. It's a challenging line. Right? Because yes. you could see a home, and we've heard stories about this, we know of instances of this, where, yes, there are inoperable pieces in one moment, right. and if you are raided, I guess, in your home, and you hide the other component parts where you're building a gun, hypothetically, they're not in use. But I just... I'm, try I'm really trying to understand who's owning something that doesn't have a serial number on it, that is something that could be, you know, in five minutes, you could create a gun with it, um, with a few pieces that you get from the hardware store. What is that object? I, I understand what you're saying. Um, I think our concern is that there are components that just because of where that piece belongs in, in the entire weapon that's built, that just do not have a serial number. Not every component, the serial number is in one place on one complete weapon, but there might be com components that don't necessarily have that. So our concern is that it's too, uh, it's overbroad, it's too encompassing, it can capture a lot of innocent, um, 
possession of, and, and in the penal law, there is a defense where if you are in possession of an antique gun even, um, that that's a, a defense. So um, that's our concern, that it might capture too many people and that uh, merely innocent possession of, of certain objects might be criminalized. I'd like to follow up with you sure. on this. I mean, I understand the words you're saying, yes. but I think what I'd like to see are examples of those situations, who we're talking about that's in those situations and whether or not they have the ability to explain away what they have. Sure. I mean, obviously we don't want to over-criminalize people, but I don't understand its application in this particular case where um, there's so much damage done by people right now um, having unserialized guns and being able to get away with having those parts and in their home, having possession of it, uh, with the intent, as you say, of uh, making an operable gun for the purpose of uh, killing people in the instances that we heard about. So I really need to understand this further. I want to understand it further, but um, I look forward to meeting with you about okay. it. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. And we're going to go to the next panel, Professor Babe Howell, the CUNY School of Law, Victor Dempsey, Legal Aid Society, uh, Taylon Murphy, Legal Aid Society, Craig Lewis, Legal Aid Society. I'm going to really ask everybody, just because we have to get out of this room by one, to really um, try to adhere to the three minutes. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, I guess I could bring up... Um, oh, okay. Well You may begin. Press your button. Okay. I'm Babe Howell. Thank you so much for taking on this incredibly important issue, for being brave enough to know and to recognize that the label gang, the title precision policing, does not allow the NYPD to move forward with impunity, playing on our fears and our trust. As you mentioned earlier, other cities have abolished the gang database. You'll probably ask me later, did crime go down? And I was like, oh, I should look that up. But I, I think we would have heard if, if, if crime had skyrocketed. I will check into that. New York City, New York State itself, in 2010, prohibited the NYPD from keeping a database of everyone they stopped or stopped and frisked in the absence of a criminal um, summons or arrest. That's New York Penal Law 140.50, subsection 4. There's New York precedent for preventing electronic database maintenance by the NYPD of people who are not accused of criminality or, or not in that situation accused of criminality. Um, gang databases that have not yet been abolished show signs of the same kinds of weakness we see in New York City's gang databases. Uh, California audit, Chicago audit, Amnesty International report on the London gang database, all of these show that many, many of the people in the gang databases do not have criminal histories, and they're overwhelmingly black or brown. New York City takes the cake with 99% black and Latino. I would urge that we await the Inspector General Urey's report. One of my colleagues said, you know, trying to fix this is like doing surgery before you get the MRI results. So while I appreciate the, uh, the step towards trying to ameliorate the harms of the gang database, I, with my colleagues, would propose waiting and getting the Inspector General's report, you know, letting them know we'd like it as soon as possible, and meeting more with affected communities. We've heard a lot about the gang database. Um, 
in my submission, I will include the IDS gang data sheet, uh, gang data entry sheet, which they gave me in 2013 in response to a FOIL. Everything they say suggests that those are still the criteria being used. Self-admission, which to be clear, they do sweat these kids. They stop them, you know, you're hanging out with these, uh, you're, who do you roll with, et cetera, et cetera, so that makes you. I saw on your social media, I'm gonna force you to unlock your phone, et cetera. They, the self-admission may very well just be, I saw on your social media X image, which I say makes you a gang member and you're representing. Um, a very interesting thing that obscures the notion that there, that these, this database is not based on association and appearance is they keep repeating that the average arrest, number of arrests for gang database entries or are 11, 11 arrests. That is a huge number of arrests, and when Operation Crew Cut was announced, uh, then, then Chief Commissioner Kelly said, we will stop these kids for everything, for riding bikes on the sidewalk, for everything to try to get information. They're stopping them, they're debriefing them. Being in the gang database makes these kids incredibly vulnerable. Now they say it's precision, and I just finished a report, and I will leave copies with you, the Bronx 120, was supposed to be the biggest gang takedown of two violent crews in the Bronx. 120 people were swept up in a militarized pre-dawn raid. Their families traumatized, doors broken in, flashbang grenades, helicopters above, SWAT teams. 60 of those people were not gang members according to the prosecutor's submission. 80 were not convicted based on any kind of violent conduct. Only about one in six was convicted of possession, possessing a gun. Many of them not accused of using the guns. So the notion that this is precision is totally a nonsense label that we do need to resist. Uh, the report has more details, but despite the fact that two-thirds had never had a felony conviction before growing up in this neighborhood heavily policed all but five ended up with felony convictions three were declined prosecution two were allowed to plead to misdemeanors two went to trial and got a felony conviction after trial and in each of those cases the evidence was so weak that i think if you had tried it without the whole rico conspiracy in a state court of peers they would have come out not guilty on most or all of the charges. Many of the people convicted for the felonies had marijuana distribution as the basis of their narcotics felony and repeat prosecution for conduct that happened before and that was adjudicated in New York case, state courts. So someone who finished a program, finished probation, double jeopardy does not bar those retrials and at least half of them were retrialed, retried for for um, for previous conduct. Okay, I we're do not have to a wrap up. Okay. On the mm -hmm. on the specific proposal, I would ask you to hold back because there's a risk of increasing youth vulnerability to gangs. Uh, police labeling, you mentioned you were afraid of your mother. In some of these cases, kids are in foster care or with guardians. They could get thrown out on the street with inaccurate gang allegations. Even accurate ones can make parents respond punitively and push kids into gangs. Inaccurate or accurate, put them in, in pretrial detention in gang units. The best way to increase gang violence is to do what the NYPD are doing in terms of suppressing gangs you're putting out fire with gasoline here. So I would say that there is no safe way to uh, notify minors and it should, and, and, and this should at least abolish as to minors and then if you, if you must compromise, you know, notice and real due process for adults. And then finally, we know New York has been successful. Why do we not have so much gang crime? What brought it down? Those were questions that were being asked earlier. We use street, outreach workers in the 50s and 60s. We now have cure violence. They told you that stop and frisk, broken windows, all these things prevented crime, and now they're telling you precision policing, which they started last week. You know, we know what to do. Uh, the city council has been very supportive of those good efforts, and I would say put more effort there. 
bring gangs even into this space as Ecuador and Barcelona have done, work with them because they are members of our community who can and will contribute. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Victor Dempsey. I'm the community organizer for the Legal Aid Society's Community Justice Unit. As you may know, we work directly with the Cure Violence sites in all five boroughs, which is 24 sites at this moment. Um, the Legal Aid Society submits its testimony to the Committee on Public Safety to share our perspectives on why the proposed law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to providing notice to minors, including the criminal group's database, is insufficient to address broader problems of having database and being labeled uh, gang involved. Uh, we thank Chair Richards for the opportunity to address this important topic. I won't take up too much time, but I do want to have some key points that are very key to us. We know for a fact this database is over-inclusive and inaccurate tool of law enforcement that disproportionately targets black and brown youth. We're working with our kill violence sites in all these boroughs. We have a direct line and open communication in relationship to all of the communities that it is directly affecting. We see these cases numerously. We have clients and community members who come up to us being that legal entity in that area and speak to us directly about these cases. Um, I work with the Cure Violence organizations across New York City has allowed us to do so also. We know right now that, uh, sorry, it's very annoying. We know right now that doing workshops, going into the communities, training the youth, putting everybody, uh, bringing awareness to what's going on, we start to see daily day with the youth coming to us and saying, wow, this is what I've noticed and this is what's been happening to me. A lot of times there aren't criminal investigations that are happening. So I listened to the testimony prior, er, a little earlier today, and I can see that blatant contradiction there. We have youth come up to us that's being targeted because they may know someone else in the communities. And they're being shaken down by officers trying to get to someone else in some cases. We've also seen instances where this label is targeting these folks and allowing and not allowing them to move forward in their lives, whether they were prior affiliated, associated, or not. Um, I, I shared a testimony with you all. I would like if you can turn to Exhibit 1 on page 11. Uh, Legal Aid has launched a four-year self-campaign where we have allowed folks in the community to forward themselves to ask NYPD if they are on this database. On that exhibit on page 11, you can see from the NYPD's language their responses to us. So I don't know if you have it. <clears throat> yes, page 11. Well, page 12, sorry. <laughs> page 12. Yeah, so those, those are responses and appeal responses from NYPD. Um, we know from our own FOIA initiative that the NYPD does not comply with FOIA requests and that they use the same boilerplate responses to deny these petitions for removal under this bill. We've done over 350 requests submitted and every single one of them has been denied. We do this so we can empower the communities to know if they're being targeted or to know if they're um, being housed in this database, just to give them the opportunity to either change lifestyle or change patterns or also connect them with our cure violence sites. We have been denied that access by NYPD under this law as well, which is very concerning. And really, we, to point out, when they do respond, they're using such language, blatantly saying, if disclosed, it will reveal non-routine techniques and procedures. So in this, we take it as they're acknowledging the fact that they're surveilling folks unwillingly and not giving them any type of due process to move on from it. Um, I do also want to point out, when it comes to sharing data as well, Unfortunately, we know that's a blatant lie. I use that term very loosely. The reason why is because the clients that we work with regularly, they come to us dealing with housing issues. If someone's been accused of being affiliated, NYCHA's trying to kick their families out. They're putting them on permanent exclusion lists. We also know that it does affect folks' employment. We have clients that's come to us where they tried for school safety or things of that nature, and they're getting this information within the department, and they're saying they're being washed out from just applying to that with no criminal activity or no priors as well. Um, we are willing to submit that information. It will be redacted, of course, but we do want to provide that as well. Um, 
going to ask you to wrap up. No problem. Lastly, I do want to talk. Um, lastly, I'll just say we feel this feel this bill is insufficient to address the larger problems with the database, and it will create a burden for the miner to begin petition process when it really should be something that's automatic right to hearing. So we just say from legal aid, we do not like want this bill to be passed, and we think there are alternatives that we're looking into and look forward to talking with you about later. Great. Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to you guys about this situation, this serious situation. Um, I'm directly speaking on the gang database and gang policing and precision policing. My name is Craig Lewis. Um, I was directly affected by gang policing and the gang database. I was swept up in a federal gang sweep due to my childhood interactions with my friends. I was a part of the Bronx 120 that she just spoke about. My evidence was Facebook posts, music videos, and the government's interpretation of my wiretap. Um, I had no criminal record, and I was in school for six to seven years. I was in grad school when it came for me. I had one more semester left to become someone like you. Um, I spent 22 months in jail, and I don't believe that me sitting in jail with no criminal record and no evidence of a crime due to a database is right. I shouldn't be in the same facility as El Chapo. I feel as though my rights were violated, but I'm here to speak on behalf of the youth in my neighborhood because I have to go back and I have the degree in criminal justice and I got the drive to become a lawyer. So what do I tell them that's down there getting gang policed and 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 stopped and searched and beat up in my neighborhood where the Bronx 120 happened? Um, I don't believe gang policing is right. I'm not talking politically wrong or politically right. I'm talking morally. What happens to the kid that grows up in that bad neighborhood, gets beat on every day? goes to his brothers for protection, but he's a nerd, and he goes to Catholic school. He doesn't even curse. He leaves the neighborhood, but keeps in contact with the people that protected him his whole life. And then he falls in a gang database and gets swept. Now he got a felony, and he can't become you. He can't. And I say you because you're a black man, and I wish I could be you, but I can't now because of what they did to me. And I'm trying to stop that from happening to the youths in my neighborhood. And that that's like from the bottom of my heart. This is not about no money or politics for me. I'm here strictly on the gang data, database. It's not right. I get pulled over three, four times a week. And before I get to talking to the officer, I let him know that you're going to let me go. I know how I look. But I have a degree. I'm educated. I'm probably smarter than you. And then they look at me. And they find books, like I, my, my, my boss Alex's um, book in my car, and they look at me like, what you know about the end of policing? And what you know about textbooks? And then they let me go every single time. Um, I'll wrap it up. What I think we should do, instead of focusing on throwing our youths in jail, even if they don't have no record, because it seems like this is all about just control and surveilling them, I think we should educate them. We should focus on educating them, turning the 16-year-olds into lawyers instead of felons, turn the 16-year-olds into doctors instead of inmates. I think maybe some safe interventions or uh, uh, camps, um, community centers, even if you took him, instead of putting him in jail, you put him in some school, military, something, maybe come back with some hope. From 16 to 25, you're growing. If you keep throwing 16-year-olds in jail, giving them felonies, how are they going to become you? And that's that's just that's that's what that's my take on the gang database. It's wrong and something need to be done, man. Stop closing your eyes. I was a good kid. I was a good kid. And Preet Barrera even told me, he even said it, that people make mistakes. They made a mistake with me and y'all are making a mistake on the whole community if you continue doing this. Thank you. Thank you. And let me just add, I know I look eloquent today, but I grew up in the neighborhood too. <laughs> and um, you know, by the grace of God, my parents with every dollar they had shipped me out of the neighborhood. Um, so I share your story because all of my friends, I know we look eloquent up here, but I grew up in South Jamaica. I mean, God Rockaway. bless you. God bless you. Know, so um, 
so I definitely share the common goal and you know our goal is just to make sure we're pulling people out of this database at the end of the day. I mean, it's, in all honesty, it should be abolished, but we're taking baby steps to at least keep the conversation flowing. So this is not the end all. Um, we all share, you know, I sat in a room as an elected official with gang members who I knew were doing shootings, and we were able to get them to do truces. So we're trying to work with them as well to make sure that's why we were a big proponent as well as cure violence in far rockaway which has really made a big difference <laughs> in really working with my brothers and people i know out there as well so we all share the common goal we just got to figure a way of how to get there um, but we want to keep this conversation going so i appreciate all of the testimony and i appreciate your story and for you coming down here you're an inspiration to me i'm trying to get to grad school so if you got to grad school <laughs> you know uh, you know that's kudos to you brother. i appreciate so keep it. up doing positive work don't let that define you keep going all right all right thank Take you care. thank you all all righty, this is the last panel. I'm going to ask everybody to really stick to time because we got to get out of here. I think they have another hearing in here. Oscar Hernandez, Diane Malika Pinkston, and also David Pacino. Righty. So David Pacino, Pacino, sorry, Diane Malika Moomin Pinkston, and Oscar Hernandez. Uh, no, that's fine. Uh, no, I don't have a copy. It's just. Uh, thank you very much to the, the chair. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, my name is David Pacino. I'm a staff attorney uh, with the Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence, which is the gun violence prevention organization founded uh, by former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. Um, I'm here today to testify in support of intros uh, 1548 and 1553. Um, I'll say in short that uh, we support both bills. We think they're fantastic and, and will be great um, efforts to combat the scourge uh, of uh, ghost guns. Um, I, uh, I have uh, in my um, written testimony um, provided some more details there. Um, I, for the sake of time, I, I don't want to dive in too deeply, um, but I will just say that we know that these things are involved in, in shootings now. Um, there have been uh, a number of shootings um, over the past several years. Uh, the number's increasing. Um, these firearms are, uh, are uh, trafficked uh, in, in large quantities. Um, they are really a, a trafficker's dream um, because they don't involve any paperwork, they don't involve any background check, um, and once they've been sold off, they can't be traced back uh, to the trafficker in the first place. Um, so we're very supportive um, of this legislation and, and really appreciative of the council's efforts um, to, to address this problem. Um, I have um, on uh, intro 1553, um, some suggestions about how uh, the legislation could be strengthened. Um, specifically first, um, I would um, I would uh, encourage the council to consider um, more expressly stating that the sale or transfer of unfinished firearms into the city um, is prohibited. Um, I know the word currently in there is dispose, and, and I have some concerns that there might be some ambiguity about whether the seller would have to be in the city. Uh, the reason I raise this is because the uh, purveyors of these parts are often internet companies who are selling from elsewhere in the United States, and I think we should be absolutely certain that this legislation um, prohibits their sales into the city. Um, the second suggestion I would make um, relates to the definition of unfinished um, frame or receiver. Um, the, uh, the language currently um, would only have uh, unserialized uh, frames or receive, unfinished frames or receivers count within the definition. Um, so if it had a serial number, it would not be covered by the legislation. Um, that's great in that it would have a serial number, but the issue is that it still would not be subject to a background check. So under federal law, a frame or receiver that's finished is subject to a background check, but the unfinished one would not be. And here, the serial number um, would, would exempt it from that background check requirement. So what I would suggest instead uh, would be to have the, uh, the that definition portion struck from there and then added um, into the prohibitor section to say that an unfinished frame or receiver can only be possessed or transferred if it has a serial number and if the transferee or possessor has a gunsmith license. Um, and then uh, the, the final suggestion um, I would make is that I would add uh, record retention requirements. So uh, the, the current serialization requirements are those that are under federal law. I would also have the record retention requirements under federal law, and I would require the sellers to retain those, and I would require those to be sent to the uh, NYPD as well. Uh, so thank you again for the opportunity to testify uh, today. Thank you so much.
Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Diane Pinkston, um, also known as Diane Malika Muming Pinkston, and I'm a mother of seven children. I grew up in tough neighborhoods all my life, and I have never been affiliated with gangs. Um, I never wanted to be affiliated with gangs, but I have problems with gangs in my community, in my building. Um, some of them work in the schools, some of them work in the, the community centers. However, I'm the type of person that is a person of multi-diversity. Um, I have a track record of doing so, but it seems as though some people that are affiliated with gangs, and it's not necessarily the Bloods and the Crips, we're talking about people that come in from overseas, uh, from Asia, Africa, uh, from Europe, that come into our cities and our towns where we live and um, they're not considered as gang members. And I find that a very serious atrocity against um, the people who live in the community because some of these people, they actually open up businesses in our community. So I have a serious problem with that. And one of the other major problems I have, which I was in the other room listening to uh, the testimony of, of you, um, I can't see your name so well. Donna. Oh. Yeah. Donovan Richards. I'm, I'm so That's sorry. Me. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I forget my name too. Yeah. You, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry. I do apologize for that misunderstanding because, you know, I affiliated with a, a lot of politicians. I come chasing them around basically to see what they're doing because I'm affected by laws that are being created. And so are my seven children. So my whole point um, in this, I do have a problem with these 60% of minorities being targeted for this crime database. But then again, it's a good thing and it could be a bad thing. The reason why it can be a bad thing because it does criminalize a lot of minorities and this 1% of these Caucasians, uh, other than blacks, um, and I, from what I understand, Hispanics are also considered white because I just came out of college in, tw in 2017. And according to the census, like Hispanics are also considered white. So what am I saying here is that, you know, um, gang membership doesn't always mean with the people on the streets with guns and knives. It also means some people would even say NYPD is a gang. Um, I don't totally agree. Um, some people will say the government is a gang. So wh where am I going with this? I mean, I think that this proposal should be a little pause on it also so I can thoroughly e uh, examine it and also come up with my, because I do case studies on just about everything, um, including myself. So I would like... A, I would like a pause on this proposal so that I can thoroughly examine it because there's a lot of things in there that is very important that I feel that I would be a, an awesome contributor to the process of this bill. I really would appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. Thank, Thank you. you. For coming down. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, um, Chairman Richards. Uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to give my testimony. Um, I'm here today because I have been directly impacted by the New York City gang database. Um, it's been over 10 years since I left my gang affiliation behind me. Um, I'm a former member of the Trinitarios um, from Brooklyn, New York. Um, you know, I've attended college. I've graduated uh, with an associates in business administration. Um, I've got, I got a job. I got a great job right now. Um, but today, to, to this day, I'm still being um, harassed. I'm still being followed around. I'm still being asked questions about gang affiliation and about the Trinitarios. Um, recently, uh, I went through a situation where I was issued a warrant for a tra uh, traffic violation. Um, I was taken to the 102nd precinct. I was sat in uh, an interrogation room for about five hours, um, waited for a gang unit to come see me. They wanted to come see me. That's how I found out I'm still affiliated with the gang um, database. I was asked questions about the Junior Guzman case. I was asked questions about a gang raid that happened in Astoria, Queens, that I have no knowledge about. Um, I was asked questions about from other gang uh, members of, in the Trinitarios group that I have no knowledge about. Um, 27, um, when I first joined this gang, I was 16 years old. You know, I made mistakes. I paid, you know, the consequences of joining the gang. Um, but I ask you today, you know, that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here today to tell you that I oppose this bill. 
uh, the two 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 three, um, is not right for indiv uh, individuals myself. Uh, still facing issues with the gang database. Here, there's an analysis that says you guys are just targeting the youth, but what about those individuals that um, are over 18? I'm not just speaking on behalf of myself. I know numerous gang members in different gang and gangs um, in New York City that have changed their life around completely. You know, have families, take care of families, go to school, still going to school now, have great jobs, you know, providing for the community that they live in. Um, so I don't think it's right that you guys just targeted the youth um, with this bill. I think you guys should take into consideration those that are above 18. Um, you know, I, I had no knowledge that I was still in this, um, in this database after my conviction. Um, so I ask you today, today, you just to see if you guys can um, not pass this bill. There's different alternatives you guys should take in the communities. Um, if I were to go around New York City right now and go to the heavy populated gang areas in New York and ask them about programs, ask them about, you know, employment, development um, in, in their neighborhoods, nobody would know anything. Um, New, uh, the, the testimony of uh, the NYPD earlier, they stated that they have numerous programs that I didn't even know about. You know, if I were to go to my neighborhood um, and ask youth in the high school areas that I know are gang, you know, that have a gang affiliated, um, nobody would know any programs these, these, you know, the NYPD was stating about. Um, so again, I want to thank you for giving my testimony, and hopefully, something gets done immediately. Thank you so much thank for you. your testimony. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out today. I want to thank everybody, especially the young men who came out to to testify um, today uh, on this legislation. Um, as we said. We look forward to working with all the advocates, continuing to have the conversation. It's the beginning of a conversation um, on a database. Um, you know, we have a lot of work to make sure that there's a more just New York City, that the justice system is working for the people that live in my neighborhood and people who are uh, impacted. So um, we look forward to continued conversations on this. I want to thank everybody for coming out today. This hearing is now closed.